Hello, everyone. Good evening. Welcome to the night's last call. My name is Derek Melinda, and you are here tonight because we are going to be talking about Strike. That's right. Tactical combat and heedless adventure. Um, this is one of our deep dive series where we take a look at a game that I know fairly well um, and have played and have had experience with and uh, and usually I'm a, I'm a big I'm a big fan of. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the, the core crux of the game and we'll get into some of the interesting parts about it. Um, but uh, yeah, this stream, as all of our streams are brought to you by the wonderful patrons over at the Nice of Last Call Patreon. Uh, their monetary support and their votes are why we have tonight's stream. Uh, this is a game actually that I, I have wanted. I've, I've teased and talked about for a very long time. Um, so sort of just as sort of a, a, of a, of a brief heads up or precursor um, and just sort of understand the kind of place where we're at. Um, so this was a, a, a very, very, very independent game. Um, you know, it had a very small Kickstarter, um, you know, not, I don't, I don't even know if, if he got more than a couple hundred, uh, you know, um, people that kickstarted it. But um, it's, uh, unfortunately, you know, the game came out, it's a complete game. I mean, it certainly doesn't have the kind of in-depth that you would game for, that you get from a system that's being supported by a whole team. It's, by and large, this is just one guy making a game. Um, but what's really interesting about this game is it is, in my opinion, a really interesting look at combining, we'll call it what it is, fourth edition D&D style tactical combat with some of the more narrative and indie game tropes that come out of Powered by the Apocalypse and uh, Burning Wheel. Now, I know that a lot of people have talked about games like Lancer and Icon and Beacon, and I have looked at those games. I have not gone super deep into those games. But one of the critiques that I often have about some of those games is that they treat the combat system and they treat the non-combat system as very different engines. It's basically like, hey, when you, when you, when you go to combat, we're going to be playing 4th edition D&D. But when we're not in combat, we're going to be using you know, Blades in the Dark or Powered by the Apocalypse rules. Even to the point of, in some games, using literally different dice. What I think is interesting about Strike, and you can, you can watch and you can agree or you can disagree, is that I think the author, Jim McGarva, did a good job of integrating a single systemic system, if that is even a word, across all of the different layers of the game to the point where the combat uh, system and you know maybe a system that you use to make some skill checks or, or resolve a negotiation all sort of speak the same relative language um, and use similar mechanics and use similar resolution mechanics in particular. Um, I think that's really, really interesting. Uh, because I think that for me personally, some people don't mind this hybrid game approach. I, th I think it, it's totally a valid approach. It's just not something that I usually like um, in my games to that end. Um, so real quick, uh, let me give uh, let me give it some shout outs who we got here. Kyle is here looking forward to uh, catching this one live. Well, we are live, Kyle. So I'm glad you're here. Grim Prism says my body is ready. <laughs> Clearly a fan. Uh, Paul. Words can't express how excited I am that you're covering a strike and even use the correct terminology because technically there is an exclamation point in the uh, in the name there. And Grim says we had to break free from the free league somehow. Yeah, this this obviously this game predates free league. Let me let me be clear uh, before we go too much further. This game came out 2014, 2015. So this game is almost a decade old. Not quite. But uh, this is as close to a fourth edition not clone because clone's the wrong word, but it's like, you know how we see all these games that sort of are derived from 5e or we see all these games that are derived from the old school D&D systems, Shadow Dark and stuff like that. This is about as close as we got to a game that was sort of derived from fourth edition, at least back in the day. Because as a you know case in point, 2015 is right around the time when D&D 5e was really becoming more of a thing, right? Like D&D uh, 4e, I think officially, I think 5e officially came out in 2014. They started like play testing it in like 2012. So this this basically came on the heels of D&D 4th edition. Um, and there's a lot of inspiration in here. And you, we'll get into it. But uh, it is kind of interesting to put it in its place and its time. That being said, the Free League stuff is great. 
Um, Bob says in, in his heart, it's it, I'm it's still it's still free league. Uh, Cole also is super excited for the strike stream. One of his favorite games in his library. Well, awesome, Cole. You can see that there is definitely a, a group of people here <laughs> who all feel like this game has something really, really powerful and really, really, really neat. Um, Shadram giving us the uh, beautiful nice last call emoji icon. What's up, Shadram? Tundalus is in the house. Uh, I hope you're having a good evening. Tundalus, I am. Thank you for joining. Tundalus, also a strike fan. Uh, Nober says, please don't make me spend $140 on Dragon Bane this week. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I did make you spend $140 on Dragon Bane this week. Don't sell me on yet another system. I will say, no beer, that uh, this system, in my personal opinion, does something very, very different than Dragon Bane. In, in, in terms of like GNS structure, it's a very different game. Uh, so I'm not saying you should play it. I'm saying that like if, if Dragon Bane is what you want to be doing, then I don't think this game is going to compete in that space. What's up, Roman? Good to see you. Um, <laughs> patiently waiting for the Marvel Multiverse RPG stream. Well, nice segue, Ken. We do have a super chat goal tonight. Uh, so tonight, there was a, the, today, I should say, this week, we had a poll. T this Thursday, right now, are we talking about Strike or are we talking about Marvel Multiverse? And it was a very close vote from the patrons of the Night's Last Call, but Strike won out. But I am nothing but a, a you know slave to capitalism and your votes and your dollars matter. Um, and so if we can achieve our super chat goal, we'll, we'll get that Marvel Multiverse uh, as a first look queued up next. Uh, Cole wants to know what is necessarily wrong with Icon and Lancer using different dice for different modes of play. That harkens all the way back to Brown Box D and D. There is nothing wrong with it. I just, I just don't like it. Um, I like for mechanics and conditions and concepts to apply universally throughout the course of the entire game. One of the reasons why I really like dungeon world uh, powered by the apocalypse games in general, Arguably, you could say Avatar Legends is the first game that I really know of that really broke this paradigm, right? Every every check is the same in Powered by the Apocalypse. Whether you're in combat or whether you're not in combat, you're just rolling 2d6, adding a modifier, and then you're checking to see if you got a full success, partial success, or a failure. So, and that's true whether you're hacking and slashing or that's true whether or not, you're, or if you're parlaying. I like that, um, that, 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 that the, the, the thread through the game becomes much more clearer, much more cleaner to me. And it's very clear to me now that I want things, I don't want combat to be its own st standalone thing. Um, you know, one of the, you know, one of the problems I have with some versions of RPGs is that combat ends up feeling a lot like combat from a classic JRPG game, like Final Fantasy, where you're playing this one game, you know, you're moving around, you're talking to people, and then all of a sudden, you know, the music starts, you spin in, and it's like you're playing an entirely separate game. Now, I get that people like that for video games, and maybe people like that, obviously, also, too, for role-playing games. But I really think that uh, it can, you know, it can kind of take you out of take you out of it a little bit, maybe. Um, Isaiah is home again. Isaiah and I have been chatting back and forth all day about Forbidden Lands. Beowulf, what is going on? Hello, hello. And Rui is here. Uh, just finished the Forbidden Lands VOD, and this one is starting. What about sanity for the fourth resource? I don't know the actions to recover, but losing it can be easy in a survival game. Well, luckily, Rui, Forbidden Land already kind of handles that. If your character loses all of their wits due to a fear or a horror effect, then when your wits break, aka go to zero, you have to roll on the horror table, and you might, you know, you might gain some sort of um, uh, uh, debilitating. Uh, mental state, um, you might, you know, uh, become uh, uh, paranoid or anxious or, you know, even something more crazy or worth psychotic, right? Because it it it, uh, it got inside of your brain. So that does kind of exist in the game. Um, it's delusions of grandeur. Um, and of course, it's a little bit comforting. You know, we've only got about 30 or 40 people here tonight. That's what we're used to. We've been we've been really popular lately. It's been a little, you know, for us, relatively you know we've been getting hundreds 100 people 120 people in our streams and we're just not used to that kind of uh of, of populace so it's nice to be back to our to our usual our usual suspects now what is going on with my chat all right there we go um so <laughs> where's my stl file for uh, for finlands well bob i had to finish work which i had a meeting at five that didn't finish till six and then I had to run and get the stream ready. So no, I don't have it ready. Also, we don't technically need it for tomorrow anyways. We're just making characters. Um, so thank you. Uh, let's head over. 
All right, so this is Strike Tactical Combat and Heedless Adventure. Um, and again, it's a uh, it's a game by Jim McCarva. And one of the things you'll you'll note right off the bat, uh, you know, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna I'm not gonna fault the game designer. Um, you know, the art style. And there's a couple of critiques, not, they're not critiques, but um, they're observations that some people may have a problem with. There's two things about this game. One is it, it's a little silly. Some of the presentation in the game, um, you know, it, maybe it's just like the very cartoony art style. Again, this was done by a very small team of people. And, you know, the art is what the art is. The second thing, which I actually, surprisingly, I've heard a lot of people really complain about, and you will see this as we get into the game. Strike is generic which is to say that it is the the mechanics are presented in a very utilitarian way rather than like a specific item. So let me give you an example of that. If you go and play Mutants and Masterminds and you go into the power section of the book, there is no power that says, you know, cold blast. There's no power that says optic laser blast. There is no power that says flame blast. There is no power that says sonic blast. There's just one power and it's called blast. It's generic. And you know what? In that game, Mutants and Masterminds, if you have an arrow, bow and arrow, and you're shooting it, AKA you're making a ranged attack that does damage, that's blast too. So everything in Mutants and Mastermind that does damage at range is called blast the thing that makes it a fire blast the thing that makes it a cold blast is your just des your description of it you know and obviously that has fictional influence on it strike is a little bit like that in that it is not designed to be this kind of um you know uh could you use the could you use the cl character class for sci-fi sure could you use it for fantasy sure it's not necessarily tied to any sort of specific genre or setting it's designed to be a little bit open and, and modular. Um, Crocodile says, I like the art style on the cover, but the interior art is mostly awful. I forgive it though. Yeah. Again, I, I'm not going to critique. Like, I, look, we're just being honest here. It's not my favorite art in the world, um, but it's also fine for, for what it is. But th this is, this is not art. That's going to get me pipe hyped to play strike. Right. Okay. Let's just, let's just call that what it is. Um, all right. So let's, let's get into, let's get into strike. Oh, but first, Shadram with a tip. Shadram tip $10, three streams in three days. It's like Christmas all over again. Thanks for keeping my bank balance lean and mean. Doing what I can, doing what I can. Well, thank you uh, for that. And thank you, you know, for all the people. I know that, you know, somebody, we had a great comment. If you'll indulge me, chat. Um, and by the way, chat, I have off from work tomorrow. I took off. Um, Yes, I took off work. I took off from work because Friday, tomorrow, we're starting a new campaign. And I wanted to make sure I had a day that I could just, you know, completely focus and prepare for my players and make sure that I am as informed of a game master that I can answer their questions uh, as well as I can. Also, as I open up my YouTube to read my comment, I see that we have passed through 11,000 subscribers. So, you know, congrats to us. Uh, and that by that, I mean you too. Uh, because, you know, our little community is, uh, is is notched another thousand subs. So always, always awesome to read. Okay. Someone on uh, my comments says, um, <laughs> this was about our Forbidden Lands stream. They said, um, uh, the, the prep says, uh, this person, Ellery says, I really wish there was a 20 minute or even better, a 10 minute version of these streams. I never know what is the best part to watch. And... Quite frankly, I'm not going to watch you for nine hours a week. I like you and I like what you do. I just feel like popping around in the three hour videos. I miss the actual point of the video. And you know what, uh, Ellery, I, I definitely, I definitely feel you. So for people like Shadram who are here all these nine hours a week, I, I, my tip, I tip my hat to you, tip my hat. Uh, Casey realizing the designer is from Toronto. Um, Sick, sick, sick. <laughs> you won and we also won. That's right. We all won. We just all won. Um, so anyways, I wanted, to, I wanted to share that because I thought that was kind of funny. Um, all right. So strike. Heedless tactical combat and heedless adventure. All right. Where to start? Well, 
let's start with um the the tone of the game. Um, it's it's pretty well you know it's pretty well designed. They have uh you know they cover the basics of what you're trying to do in this game, and they have nice little sidebars that are very clearly spell out. You know, side notes are they're very much commentary from the author, which I really like the style of this game. Um, and uh, you know, it, right in the beginning, you know. This is a very interesting way of discussing the rules. And I like that they're very clear about this, okay? They say, don't demand nonsense. The rules of the game are an abstraction. And sometimes, slavish devotion to this leads to nonsense. Don't do this. Use the rules in the spirit they were intended. Um, and that is just really good advice uh, for everybody. You know, because a lot of people come up with this idea of like rule zero, right? Right. And I don't necessarily like the idea of rule zero. What I do like is when a game designer says, hey, you should use these rules, but you know what? These rules are an abstraction. And if you follow them all the time, it will be weird and awkward. Don't do that. The rules have an intention. The rules have a meaning. This is one of the reasons why for me, role-playing games are so important to be about something, right? And to have principles and to basically lay out, this is what our game's about because that's your North Star, right? That's that's your guiding light. At the end of the day, as a game master, if you know that at the end of the day, these are the five things that I'm trying to accomplish with this game and this game system, then when the rules or the situation becomes really wonky, you can just say, okay, wait, wait, what am I trying to accomplish here in this game? What are my principles? And then you can kind of ultimately make a decision or a ruling that best embraces those principles. And I think that's so important. Um you know, and again, there's a very laid back style to this, you know, gaming uh, thing where it's like, you know, it's like, uh, <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, like they're talking about tone here and they say, so what do you do if somebody has not proven to be able to handle keeping a consistent tone or has otherwise been bending the rules? First, give them the benefit of the doubt and treat it the same way you treat somebody dealing themselves first in poker or talking in a movie theater. You could say, hey, I know you mean well, but there are rules. They exist for a reason. We don't do that in this game. If everyone involved is an adult, that's all it should take. <laughs> you know, like very, you know, it's very matter of fact advice that I think is, is pretty, pretty great. All right. So let's get to the base. Let's get to the core mechanic of this game. And again, they're coming out with it straight off the bat. All right. This is a D6 system. And by that, I mean, literally a single D6. You are going to roll a D6 and that is going to determine what the outcome of your action is. And generally speaking, there are two kinds of roles, skill roles and opposed roles, right? Opposed roles come later. In a skill role, the first thing that you do is to state your intention. Be very de deliberate about this. This is very clear to anybody who's been playing, say, Blades in the Dark. So what is it that I want to achieve and how do I want to achieve it? What is my task, right? And then based on what you've decided and what your intention is and what you're trying to achieve, you and the GM decide which of the skills on the character sheet is appropriate to roll. And then you roll a D6. And here's what you get. First, we look if you're skilled or you're unskilled. So strike is kind of like um, fifth edition D&D in that way, right? Where a skill is either you either have it uh, or you don't have it, <laughs> um, you know, Putting it into a more, again, this game came out in 2015, long before Magpie. But you'll see this exact kind of uh, basis in modern Magpie games. I'm talking about Root. I'm talking about Avatar Legends, right? And the way that Magpie does this is Magpie usually has two moves that handle basically doing shit. One is basically doing it with your skill, and the other one is basically doing it because you're an adventurer and you might get lucky. So, you know, in, in, I think in Root, it's called, you know, Trust Fate. And in um, Avatar Legends, it's called Press Your Luck or something. And the other one is called, you know, Using Your Roguish Talent. Or in Avatar, it's called Using Your Skills or uh, Training. So it's kind of this, it's two worlds, same, similar mechanic. We just said, are we skilled or are we not skilled? We roll the D6. All right. For starters, you can see that if you are skilled, okay, presumably you're doing something that you're, you're good at. Um there are, you you succeed on four of the six rolls, right? So you are succeeding 66% of the time. Several of those successes uh, just come free of charge or even with a bonus. Think of this as an additional opportunity. It's kind of like rolling a critical hit. And it's gonna happen one in six times. And I actually think that that's like, 
a perfect amount of times, right? Um, because one in six times is like around 15% of the time. And I'm really, I, that's like a really good number for me for how often I want a skill to generate something additional because if it happens too often. It doesn't feel special enough and it can actually become kind of a drag on the game anyways. Um, so I think that's really great. If you roll a three, you get your success, but with a cost. And again, you know, we're, we, we know our power by the apocalypse. We know our blades in the dark. We know what success with the cost is. You succeeded, but there is a price to pay. There is a penalty to be paid. All right. And then lastly, you'll note that two and one aren't failure per se. It's a twist. If we were talking about power by the apocalypse, we might call this a GM move. And I'll even go so far as to say that, again, I'm assuming most of you at this point are fairly familiar with Powered by the Apocalypse. Let me know in chat if you don't. I would say that rolling a two is kind of like rolling a soft move for the GM. Rolling a one is like the GM gets to make a hard move, right? Um, they're going to create a situation that is uh, a problem, but it also is going to cost you something. That, that, that starts to feel a little bit more like a harder move. Um, so that's what happens when we roll with skilled. If we're unskilled, we get a similar distribution, but you'll note that there's no way that we can get the success with a bonus, right? Our odds are a little worse, not terrible. Look at this, 50% of the time, 50% of the time that we are unskilled with a skill, we still succeed. But obviously uh, there's a greater chance that we'll get you know a cost for it. And we cannot succeed with a bonus instead uh, well, you can succeed with a bonus, but instead you can succeed with a bonus or you could choose to not take your bonus and instead you can learn the skill. So you were unskilled when you made the roll, you roll a six, now you're skilled. I think that's really fun and cool. Now, again, is this game super serious and, you know, this massive structural gameplay organization? No, because obviously it's like, oh, I rolled, I rolled a critical hit. So on a D6, mind you. Uh, and so now I get a skill improvement. Like, obviously, this, this is not a game that you're, you know, you're worried about that kind of thing for. But this is the core mechanic of the game. And here's the key. This core mechanic of the game covers the entire gauntlet of the game, from skill checks like this to combat later on, as you'll see. Now, it, you know, when, you, when we look at the combat table, you'll, you'll see this same concept or pattern um, repeated. Now, again, this game came out in 2015, so... He had the benefit of the doubt. Maybe he had learned uh, about D&D 5th edition, uh, which is great because it's a really great system for this. And, you know, we didn't learn about this till I'm trying to think when like Homebrew World came out. So Homebrew World is is a hack of Dungeon World that's pretty popular. And Homebrew World introduced the idea of advantage and disadvantage to a Powered by the Apocalypse game. Normally in Powered by the Apocalypse games, you roll 2d6 and you add them together. But you can roll with advantage with 2d6. What you do is you roll 3d6 and you take two highest dice. Or you could roll with disadvantage, which is roll 3d6 and take the two lowest dice. Well, guess what? Um, this game works the same way. You can have advantage and you can have disadvantage. And, and again, they're very clear here, just like a PBTA game. That's right. The difficulty of the task does not factor into the results. There is no DC. And, you know, it's like Dragon Bane in that way. It's like powered by the apocalypse in that way. We're not so concerned with figuring out, is this, you know, is this, you know, I want a D20. Do we need to roll a 13 or do we need to roll a 14? It, it's not concerned with those levels of granularity. The only thing, you know, uh, there's no difference between lifting a heavy object and lifting a heavier object, you know, and again, this game is being very forthright. That's because this game is not concerned with simulating the physics and realities of the game world in your mechanics, right? It's being very clear and deliberate about that. That being said, if you have a really strong advantage, then you can roll advantage and you get to roll 3d6 or 2d6 and take the higher die. And if you have a significant drawback, you roll at disadvantage. And I, I think that's a perfect range of things, right? In fact, I would say that this game essentially has five ranges of, of actions. A player wants to do something. Okay. The uh, action one is the, the GM says that is so easy. You succeed. It is automatic. There's not even a need for a role. 
The second set is to say, you have a lot of advantages to this, but there's still a chance that something could go wrong. There's still a little bit of risk. There's maybe still a little bit of drama. Roll with advantage. The third, the middle, you know, in, in uh, the first two, you might call, you know, controlled in Blaze in the Dark. And then the middle one, you say, okay, this is a risky standard roll. We're going to roll 1d6 straight up. Then we get to desperate, right? Uh, there's still a chance you could succeed, but this is a long shot. You're going to be rolling with disadvantage. And then the last category is you just say, no, <laughs> the way that you have described this and the way that you want to do this cannot happen. And that's it. You have, as a GM, you only have to decide between those five situations. Yes, no, roll with advantage, roll with disadvantage, or roll normally. And again, in Power by the Apocalypse term, I'm sorry, in uh, Blades in the Dark terms, it's the same thing. Yes, no, desperate, risky, controlled. It's the same basic idea um, applied here. All right. And some of this stuff we know, you know, if you succeed, you get what you want. The GM and other players can embellish or add details, but they can't not add anything that takes away from your victory. You get what you want, all right? Um, so we talk about bonuses and successes, or sorry, bonuses and twists. And again, a bonus, you know, the, the closest thing that I can sort of connect it to is think opportunities from uh, Legend of the Five Rings, or maybe think um, spin. I don't know that they still call it spin, but think like spin from fate, it is a secondary benefit, right, that you gain as a result of this. Um, and again, it could be that you find out information, you make a friend, that you get a useful object or anything else. It could be that your success was beyond what you would aim for, or it could be a boon that is tangential and unrelated that you gain during the course of your success. You, the successful player, choose the bonus you get. The GM and the other players may have a say or insist on modifications if your idea doesn't quite work for whatever reason, but this is your chance to contribute something cool. So the way I look at this is, it's not quite your opportunity to declare a narrative truth, but if we think about Fabula Ultima, in Fabula Ultima, um, if you roll a critical hit, which is you succeed with doubles, um, is that right? Yeah, you succeed with doubles? Yeah, I think that's right. It's been, a, it's been a minute, but yes. If you roll doubles and you succeed in Fabula Ultima, you get a critical. But what does a critical hit do in Fabula Ultima? Is it extra damage? No, it's you get an opportunity. And what does that opportunity let you do? It lets you add something to the game. And it's your opportunity to, to kind of grab the spotlight a little bit and do a little bit of narrative showing off. And again, this is not going to happen every time. This is going to only happen double sixes. I knew there was a, thank you, Pepperer. I knew Pepper. I knew that there was like a little bit of a qualification for that. Yes, you're right. Double sixes. Um, I think fate is succeed with style now. Yes. Which to be clear is still probably a bad name. I mean, it's better than spin, but you know, you, I think, I think that you are correct, Cole. Uh, one second, I'm going to open up the window. It's actually kind of. All right. Um, and again, you know, this, this game is sort of like teaching you how to be a, you know, a responsible adult, three guidelines to ensure your idea doesn't get vetoed. Your bonus needs to be in keeping with the tone of the game. Your bonus should not invalidate important aspects of the game or any of any other characters planning. And your bonus should not dwarf your success. You won't go wrong. If you just give yourself advantage to an appropriate future role. So there you go. Worst comes to worst, just say, oh, you know, this sets me up really nice for my next attack and I have advantage, right? That's like the easy default, but those are the guidelines. And again, guidelines are important because they let us all know what we're trying to do here. Um, all right. So that's like that, that's success. But what happens when we don't get a success, right? That's success. But what about, what about if we don't get a success? What if we get a twist? Okay. And remember, uh, a twist comes only on a two or a one when we're skilled and it comes on a three, two and a one when we're unskilled. Okay. A twist means something threw off your plans. Your task may or may not have been successful, but something somewhere has gone wrong. It may, now, that's important. Your task may or may not have been successful. It may have been successful. You may have succeeded, but something somewhere has gone wrong. It may or may not be your fault 
It may not even be a bad thing, although it often is. And I don't need to, you know, again, this is a very nicely done way of talking about making a GM move. Um, because again, a GM move, you, you want to, it doesn't have to be failure. It doesn't have to be bad, but it is your job to, you know, make the game interesting and to make the game challenging and to make the game feral and to make the game or whatever the principles of your game are. Um, when you get a twist, the GM gets to narrate how you came to the twist. In the course of their narration, they might say something that your character does. Well, let me repeat that. When you get a twist, the GM gets to narrate how you came to the twist. In the course of their narration, they might say something your character does. This is part of the game. If the GM oversteps their bounds, speak up and talk to them like an adult. But in general, your job as a player is to roll with it and make it real. This is such good writing and such good advice. Think about it this way. When you step into the ring to roll die, you are letting some of the control of your character and the story go, and you're trusting it to the dice. When you get a six and you get a success with a bonus, you, the player, get an opportunity to sort of say, I'm going to change and shape this story. Well, sometimes it, the opposite comes true as well. And sometimes when you roll low, guess what? Sometimes the GM gets to say something about your character. When you roll a six, you, the player, got to say something about the GM's world. When you roll a two and you get a twist, the GM gets to say something about your character. Um, maybe your character screwed up. People do that. You do not get to say, no, my character would never make a mistake like that. Sorry, the dice disagree. God, I forgot how much I love this writing. That's part of life, and that's part of the game. Remember, you don't know everything there is to know about your character. Let me repeat that again. Remember, you don't, you, the player, don't know everything there is to know about your character. And part of the fun of playing a character is finding out new things about them. Twists are a vital part of that process. Some twists can be planned. A good GM often has a surprise ready in their back pocket, but they are usually improvisational. Um, so that is a really, really, uh, great advice, especially if you're going to play in a narrative, a, a game that has a more narrative element to it. You, you need to be willing to play the part, right? A lot of people talk about how I'm an actor. Well, then act like an actor. Okay. When you're an actor on set and they do a script rewrite and they give you new lines and they tell you that your character is going to go do this then your job as an actor is not to say, I'm not saying those lines. Your job as an actor is to portray those that script convincingly and believably. Now, we don't have script writers or screenwriters, hopefully, in our RPG games, but we do have dice. And we all have to, we all have to play by their rules. And I like that a lot. Um, lastly, costs. You know what I always talk about this? Um, you know, Part of the thing that I like about games is leverage, levers, so that I can, you know, me and my players can negotiate for what they want. I don't want to give them a free lunch. I like the player's idea. I want to go ahead with it. But, you know, they they rolled low or, you know, that, that that's asking a lot out of them. And I like to be able to assess costs to the player that are meaningful. Now, if you go all the way back to the eon, you know, the beginning of the hobby, the, really the only cost was hit points. That was the only cost that you could really do. Um, and hit points didn't always make sense as a cost, especially in a more narrative game. And of course now in modern game, hit points don't really mean much like they used to. So having games that give you these abilities to uh, ability to apply costs and still go with the punches is really, really important. So, so while I cost, okay, is something that gives you a disadvantage going forward. It, a cost is something that gives you a disadvantage going forward. Whereas twists are narrative, costs are mechanical. And again, we can go back here and look at our chart. A twist is narrative, okay? A cost is mechanical. It should still probably, you know, fit with the fiction, but it's more of a, you know, the twist is more of a narrative thing. The cost is more of a physical mechanical thing. Um. A condition, uh, there, are, there are three types of costs, conditions, flaws, and favors, okay? 
A condition is something inherent that prevents you from performing at your best. For example, maybe in lifting the portcullis, you get a success with a cost. You've raised it. You have succeeded. But you've gained a condition. So now you are winded or you're exhausted. The GM decides what condition is appropriate. If you've been watching this stream for the last several days and you've been seeing me talk about forbidden lands and you've been seeing me talk about wanting levers to be able to do things, it's to be able to do exactly stuff like this, right? When you get a success with a cost, it's like, okay, your character did succeed, but they, had a, they have to pay a price. What can we do here? Well, we can apply a condition. A flaw is a known problem with an item or with information. It's not a surprise. You know the specific deficiency, although you may not know how to correct it, okay? So they, they kind of go into descriptions of this later, but like the idea is that like, yes, you find the item, okay? But it's only gonna work once, you know, because they, you know, or you find the information, okay? But uh, it's missing the pop proper password to get in. It tells you everything you need to know, but the password. It's this idea of giving the player what they succeeded for, but applying that, that it's not perfect. In Blades in the Dark, we might call this lessened effect. And lastly, from a more social standpoint, another example of a cost could be a favor. You might owe somebody a favor. It means they, if, it means they agreed to help you so long as you help them in the future. Slightly more generally, a favor means that a character feels that you owe them. You and your friends have disadvantage asking that person or any of their associates for further help until that favor is repaid. Remember, this is mechanical. Disadvantage, right? Bad stuff. Failing to fulfill a favor in a timely manner gets you a bad reputation. That provides the same disadvantage, but it's harder to eliminate since simply repaying the original favor may no longer be enough. All right? So this idea of a mechanical social consequence if you, if you kind of renege on your deal. Um, which one you get depends on what you're trying to do. If you were trying to jump over a pit, you probably wouldn't have your cost be a favor, right? But you might have it be a condition or a flaw. So the, uh, the, the game gives you some conditions. There are minor conditions and major conditions. Again, if you've been watching my forbidden lands, you know that I was talking about wanting minor conditions and major conditions. And it says that this is not a comprehensive list. This is very common in this writing game uh, style where you say, oh, it's, you know, it's not, uh, it's not, um, what's written here is not everything in the game. What's written here is just some examples and you should add more if it's appropriate, right? Make some up. So we've got minor conditions. We've got winded, exhausted, which kind of sounds similar, lost your confidence, angry, now, major con conditions, injured, sick, cursed, right? And as an example, just to kind of show you here, you know, example, my cyberpunk setting, because you could be using strike to play in a cyberpunk setting, has a major condition called infected, representing a computer virus getting into a character's wearable electronics. This doesn't affect every role that they make, although it affects most. I make exceptions for things that the characters do unaugmented by their high-tech gear. Um, example, games with psychic antagonists or with themes of insanity might benefit from having a major condition focused on that. I use shattered for someone whose mind has been badly affected by psychic assault in my sci-fi setting. So again, this is the idea of, you know, again, mechanically conditions are pretty simple. They basically just give you disadvantage, but theming it and making it appropriate in the fiction carries a lot of weight. Um, all right. Um, and then they've got, you know, how do you recover from the conditions, right? And again, some of these make, you know, some of these are, are narrative, you know, uh, to recover from winded, you just need to rest and get something to drink. And again, remember, you could create your own conditions. And so it's up to you to sort of decide how they get resolved. Um, and so sometimes you might have to do it mechanically. For example, to recover from lost confidence, you have to succeed at a role despite having disadvantage. Other conditions might be recorded, recovered narratively. So I'm going to like just really quickly here uh, skip ahead because what makes this game really crazy, you know, everything that we've just been talking about, you're like, oh yeah, that's, that's, you know, that's like very fate, you know, it's very powered by the apocalypse, very burning wheel, but I'm just skipping ahead here. This game has grid-based tactical combat. <laughs> 
Okay. And you have powers much like you do in fourth edition. Okay. And I, 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 I just want you to know that and I will get to it. Don't worry. We'll, we'll talk about this module. Um, but I do want to mention that it all works together and that's, what's really, really cool about it. Okay. Um, all right. Let's go back to the, the, the rules here. There we go. Okay. Recovery from our conditions. Um, by the way, there's no list of skills to look up. A skill is just a word on your character sheet. They are made up on the spot. Okay. So there's no list of skills. When you write a skill down on your character sheet, it is just whatever, you know, whatever you think is appropriate. And then if it applies, you roll in the skilled table. If it doesn't apply, you roll on the unskilled table, right? There's no master list. So you know, write things down and if they apply, but then you might say, well, my skill is, uh, awesomeness and I'm just great at everything. And that's where we have no stretching in, um, burning wheel. They call this, uh, no reaching. They call it pathetic. They're like, it's uh, it's annoying at best and it's pathetic at worst. And again, players, please don't stretch to make a skill fit your task. GMs do not let your players stretch. First, you already have tons of freedom to define your skills and you shouldn't need to stretch. Second, rolling an unskilled is how you learn new skills and improve your character. Basically, don't be a dick. Also, fun once. Here's a neat little rule with big implications. You cannot roll for the same task and intent more than once. This works two ways. First, if you're trying to climb a rope to the fourth floor, the GM can't make you roll to climb to the second floor, then again to the third floor, then again to the fourth floor. Burning Wheel calls this letting it ride. One roll decides whether or not you accomplish your aim, and if you roll badly, then the GM has the right to decide when your luck runs out. You might falter at the start or fall from 30 feet up. On the other hand, you cannot roll to climb the rope, fail, and then roll and try again. A roll assumes you are giving it your best effort the very first time. So basically, you roll once, and we let it ride, all right? If the situation changes dramatically, then you might get to roll again. Um, <laughs> so very, very, you know, good advice in general for, for games that you don't want to get buried in a bunch of dice rolling. Um, all right. Uh, they talk about a posed roll here um, where basically uh, you roll the dice, okay? Um, the higher roll wins, and if a character wins by three or more, they win completely. They get what they want, and the loser pays the price of their actions. If they only win by one or two, the winner gets what they want, but the loser gets to have like a concession. They get like a say in what happens, okay? Um, and that's really interesting, right? This, this idea of concessions. And if you're familiar with Burning Wheel, you'll know that, or Torchbearer or Mouse Guard, that a lot of Burning Wheel and Mouse Guard is about this idea of concessions. When two people combat, it's very rare that you get an, a complete winner and a complete loser. Sure, one side may win the conflict, but the other side didn't do nothing. And so the winners owe the losers a concession. And the amount of the size of that concession depends on how well the losers did. All right? Um, and they, we've got stuff in here about helping and linked roles, okay? I'm not going to get like too deep into the, you know, to the, to the stuff here. Cause there's a lot here to this game. Okay. But they got something in here about wealth is just a dice roll, you know, cash. And we can come back to some of this stuff here. Um, but what I want to talk about next is, uh, basically. So we're going to create a character. Hmm. How do I want to do this? All right, so that's like the that's like the basic gist of the game. Now you get to create a character, you create a background, you create an origin, right? You choose things about your character, your kits, your relationships, your motivations, right? And it says now you're ready for everything except tactical combat. Okay, the rules for creating that side of your character sheet are found on page 98 after the tactical combat chapter, right? And this is something that I think is really really cool about this game. And what's really really cool about this game is. You have all the basic skill stuff, but then the game has what they call subsystems. 
built on top of all of these basic rules. There's team conflict, chase, and tactical combat. Basically, one of the biggest problems with 4th edition D&D, and I think this is true with a lot of games, is the tactical combat rules are really, really, really detailed. But the truth of the matter is, a lot of times you don't want to, you don't need that kind of detail to deal with every single combat. It tends to make it so that, you know, uh, you want all of the combats to be important because you don't want to spend 30 minutes or 45 minutes or an hour on some relatively easy fight. You know, say a random encounter, you know, it might take up half your night. So it seems like it's a waste, but you also don't want to like, hand wave it and just say, oh yeah, you killed those people. What's really cool about Strike is it has three different levels of sort of in-depthness for resolving a conflict between two people, all right? Now, team conflict is basically a very abstracted way of doing anything. It could be social, it could be physically a combat, you know, fighting with swords and fireballs or uh, energy rifles. Okay, and you end up rolling and making attacks, but it's very abstract. For example, you might choose to, I'm going to progress towards our action, you know, towards our objective. And you would just narratively describe, there's no grid, there's, it's all theater of the mind. You're just, you know, sort of trying to take the battle to the enemy or in a, you know, social conflict, you might be like, I start, you know, smooth talking all the people here in the, at the conference that I'm trying to, uh, you know, make nice with all the, uh, the the richy rich people. You can also do a reckless effort, which gives you even more uh, effectiveness, but you take a hit. You could block, which increases your group's defense, or you could take one for the team, which gives you a lot of defense, but you owe a personal concession. All right. So what ends up happening here is you have your team, they have their team. And once everyone has chosen action, you add up all your advanced modifiers, all your A's from everything that everybody did. You do the same with your defense. And if your advance is higher than their defense, your advance is successful. If it's, if it's lower, it fails. And then you repeat with the, the opponents. So basically you have team opponent and team you, and you compare your basically attack or advance to their defense. But note, this is, this is the outcome. If both of you fail to advance, then it's a draw, and we do the another round of conflict. If they're both successful, okay, it's a push. Each side takes a hit with a capital H, and then we continue the conflict. If we tie, then the other fails, it's a draw. If one ties and the other succeeds, it's a push. And if both it, they tie and it, it ends because of outside forces, it's a double tie. But if one succeeds and one fails, the conflict ends C winning and losing. So what this means is it's a very quick way of five or 10 minutes of doing any sort of conflict. Every player gets to contribute in advance, but it's very abstract and it's very like more generic. And you are basically just sort of calculate it, taking all of these. These are the options that you can do in this combat, but it's not really a combat combat, right? It's a conflict. So it, it, giving players this option is really, really cool because it lets you do something really, really fast. Like we can just go around the table and just say like, uh, okay, um, what are, what are you doing this turn? You know, you're like, okay, um, I think we need to, we need to win. We, we need to, I'm going to, I'm going to charge in there. I'm raging. I'm swinging my sword left and right. And you're like, okay, that sounds like you're doing all out effort. Yeah, totally. All right. So Team PCs gets plus three advance, but minus one to their total defense value. And then somebody else says, oh, the barbarian's going to get us all killed. All right, I, I'll, I'll worry about our defense. Okay, I'll go in there and, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll block and I'll give our team back two points of defense, right? And you just kind of do that as a group and then you end up coming up with a number of a, your sort of offensive score and your defensive score. And the GM will do the same thing, all right? Now, generally the GM is going to sort of, uh, they're not necessarily going to do this for every single one of their creatures or everything or things. Um, the opposition to the players typically has few, far fewer choices to make in a conflict the players do. Instead of choosing all of these different actions, the opposition is simply represented by an advance and a defense score. Typically, the opposition have advance and defense scores equal to one less than the number of player. The GM will choose one action per round for the opposition, and this is secret, okay? 
So in other words, the GM's going to basically say, yeah, the monsters are going all out this turn round. They're the, the, gom the goblin horde is charging. So it has a baseline attack. It has a baseline defense. I'm going to say that they went all out. So I'm going to add plus three to their uh, offense. I'm going to add subtract one from their defense. That's their, that's their total this turn. Okay. Um, so anyways, that is the basic concept of the, uh, of the team conflict. All right. And when you're in a team conflict, one of the things that you start to learn about here is this idea of strikes. And I don't want to, I don't want things to get confusing here, but let me just say that, let me see if there's a good strike table. Um, rendering title. Sorry, I don't know where they talk about strikes. It's been a while since we've done since we've done this here. Uh, oop, doesn't look like they really talk about strikes. Eighty nine. Okay. Mm. Now they don't talk about it. All right. Um. So the thing about strikes is in this game, it's why it's called, I, I, you could argue it's why it's called strike. And this is how the game ties together narrative combat and how it ties together tactical combat. When you earn strikes, it's basically like you saying, I owe the other side, okay, a concession. So if you win a conflict, right? could be a combat, could be a negotiation, could be whatever. If you win that and your side, your character, your party has no strikes against them, then it, your victory is complete, right? It's a total, total victory, unconditional surrender. You get everything, they get nothing. Good day, sir, right? It's complete winning. But what ends up happening is even when the opposition loses, they oftentimes do accomplish something. And in this game, that is represented by acquiring strikes. So as we were saying before, in the team conflict, when, you know, we were talking about before about like what happens if your role and their role uh, are successful and the, and, the, and the fight continues. Well, in that case, both sides take a hit. And one of the things that a hit can do is they can assign you a strike. When we look at the sort of tactical miniature combat that occurs, you know, very similar to what, you know, Pathfinder 2 or fourth edition or any of those things, you can see that after the fight, we look at how many strikes our side has gotten. So when we're, when our character, let's see if this is here, when you are first bloodied in combat, AKA when you are first reduced to 50% hit points, this is normal hit points, like, you know, a D&D game. You take a strike. If you get taken out and go down to zero hit points, you take two strikes, all right? If you're completely taken out, meaning not just dropped to zero, but like in the, in the fiction of the game, you know, you're basically unconscious, taken out of the fight completely, you take a strike. So what ends up happening is while you're playing this game with hit points, even if your party wins and, you know, you're going to heal to full at the end of the fight or whatever, Hit points aren't the real mechanic here. It's strikes. And so even if your party defeats the goblins, but let's say, you know, uh, you know, Tundalus uh, got bloodied. So that's one strike. I got bloodied. Hell, maybe I got bloodied and reduced to zero. So that's one strike and two more strikes. My, you know, our, our team has four strikes. What we have to do is we have to take a look at all of the strikes added up on our team. Okay. Let N be the number of players on your team and S be the total strikes, okay? If we have less strikes than the number of people on our PC's team, we have one total victory in this combat. But if we got too many strikes, even though we won the fight, we have to start owing concessions. And this is a narrative effect that we have to tie to the group to the point where if strikes is super high, 
then we win, but it's like a Pyrrhic victory, right? Your enter, your enemies are defeated, but we do not get what we are achieving. And so, you know, this is one of those things where it's like, you could play through the game and say, yeah, you guys won the fight, but guess what? Um, the, uh, the monsters that, you know, that the, 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 the thing that you were trying to get to and stop, um, the ritual is starting because it took too long because you were delayed by the monsters. Um, it, it, it basically turns the entire tactical miniature combat into a really big, long, complicated single dice roll, okay, back all the way to the beginning of the game, right? So you could do a combat with this table and just say, oh, you're fighting, your party's fighting the goblins. Okay, roll, you guys are really good at combat. Somebody roll D6 and they roll a five and you go, yeah, you totally kill the goblins and it's awesome. Great. Or you could roll a three and say, oh, you know, you, 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 do, you kill the goblins, but you know, one of you is a little hurt or, you know, you guys are delayed or there's some other problem that comes up, right? There's a, there's a cost. You could do combat like that, but obviously some people find that to be very unsatisfying. So instead, this game gives you this whole tactical combat system, right? With a grid and a tax of opportunity and powers. But what it does is it takes the outcome of that combat and translates it back to the core mechanic of the game, which is basically, did you get a full success, a partial success, or, you know, it, it, or did you lose and there's like a condition or a twist? Um, that is like really, really awesome because what it lets you do is it means that no matter what resolution system you use for the combat, you could use a single skill check, right? Literally one die roll. You could also use this team conflict system that we were talking about where each person, it's very abstracted. It's very general. You don't need a grid. It's very abstract and you can just you know, describe generally what you're doing. You could be completely narrative about it. And then everybody basically, you know, you, you might have an idea in mind, you know, if you describe yourself as leaping from the battlements with your great ax swinging wildly, it would feel pretty weird if you said total defense after that, but it allows you to kind of just say whatever you want and then, you know, pick one of these 12 things. And mechanically that'll have an effect. And then you add up your A's, you add up your D's and you compare that to the enemy. And again, when all of that is said and done, we're going to have an outcome of basically full success, partial success, really shitty success, even though we did get it, but we, we really owe a lot or we failed and we, we didn't get what we achieved. And there's a consequence for that. But even when you do a tactical combat, right, with all the attacks of opportunity and the grid and all that other stuff, it still at the end of the day maps back to concessions. And looking at and, and coming up with a narrative story for how this you know fight makes sense, right? And that's what I think is really, really, really cool about this. Um, and by the way, um, you know, you know, they're, they're, the players do you know the players win and the players get you know what they want, but again, they owe a concession. So, like a good example might be like maybe the players got a lot of strikes and they're fighting the lich and they kill the lich but they have a lot of strikes, okay? To the point where they owe a major concession. So you might say, okay, the Lich is destroyed, but as he's destroyed, he pours his, and his flactory was destroyed. He, you beat him, he's destroyed, but he pours his spirit and soul into one of the PCs. He doesn't take you over, but he is now safely living within your spirit or within your body. He's battling for control, but, you know, trying to break free, but he's just, he's basically using you as a phylactery, <clears throat> AKA Harry Potter, Lord Voldemort, you know, very, very tropey and very pop, you know, thing. It's like, well, what, what, why, why? Well, because you owe a concession, you got a lot of strikes. So the narrative of the game isn't just we win or we lose, right? A lot of D20 games, it's very like we either win and we get everything or we lose and we get nothing. And that is not how this game works. Uh, and that is, I think, pretty awesome. 
Um, and you know, when we talk about what concessions you might owe, especially if you lose, um, the game talks about this here about, you know, what about character death? Well, that depends on the tone and setting of your campaign and also the actions of the players, but you should agree before play, whether death is on the table and under what circumstances it might come up. So this is again, where you could say, Hey, you know, it's almost kind of like Fabula Ultima, right? Where it's like, is this a surrender situation or is this a sacrifice situation? And, you know, if it's a big fight and it's a big deal and maybe the player, owe, you know, the player group owes a major concession and maybe a character comes up and says, you know what, guys, I think the concession I'm going to offer the GM is, you know, my character dies from his wounds, you know, that final strike, that final blast of dark energy as he was charging into the lich, you know, it's too much. And, you know, he's trying to hide it and you, and then, you know, you recognize too late and he's like, you know, he has his you know, awesome, cool, you know, death speech and death scene. And then he dies and everyone's like, oh man, that, you know, like you can, you can make this a, a, about the player and you can make this an option for the player to really sort of offer up themselves on the sacrificial altar to pay the price for the group's, you know, tough, tough loss, or I should say tough victory because they did win, but they owe something major. Um, So that's really, I think really, really cool. So, we have all this, this super narrative game, right? With basically multiple levels of success, success with costs, twists, basically very much like a GM move. So how is this game at all like fourth edition? Well, the way that this game is like fourth edition is through the tactical combat module. Um, here we go. I'm trying to find it. Here we go. Tactical combat. Okay. So. So you're in a fight. Time to break out the combat rules. Well, not necessarily. Use these rules only if the fight is interesting. If you have time, making a skill roll or two makes a few minutes. These rolls might take half an hour. And if the whole party is involved, rare is the time that you want to leave everybody out. Hey, the party is split and the rogue and the fighter need to have a, uh, a quick battle. Don't use tactical combat because you're not going to make the rest of the players wait for 30 or 40 minutes while the fighter and the rogue battle it out. But you could have the fighter and the rogue do a really quick uh, team combat where they'd use their abstract choices and it's over in, you know, just a couple minutes. That's not a bad ask to ask other people. And then, but if everybody's present, everybody's got something to do, it's a big moment. It feels like a moment that deserves the spotlight. Then you might pull out the tactical combat module. And here we get more like a D20 game, right? We take turns, and on your turn, you can do three things, all right? And you can do them in any order you could like. Now, this is where there's like a fourth edition overlap, and there's actually some things here I like about this. So in fourth edition, just for people edification, you have three actions. You have a standard action, you have a move action, and then you have a minor action. The minor action is a lot like the bonus action from fifth edition, except that you always have it and you don't just have it sometimes. And you can use it for some specific things like pulling out a weapon or drinking a potion. Additionally, you can trade your powers down in fourth edition. In other words, a standard action can become a move action and a move action can become a minor action. So in theory, a character could turn their standard action into a minor. They could turn their move into a minor and then they have their minor action, which is three actions. So yes, fourth edition has three actions. I don't know why people treat the three action economy as a Pathfinder 2 thing, but whatever. In this game, you have three actions on your turn. You can move. You can use a power to attack. And the third, which is very similar to a standard action of fourth edition, but the third thing that's a little bit different is you can use a power from your role. Now, again, little for people who don't know fourth edition, most of you, I assume, do. Fourth edition uh, sort of uh, doubled down on this idea of your character having a role in the party in combat. Are you the defender? Are you the striker? Are you the controller? Okay. And the way that fourth edition did this is a class was a defined as a certain type of role. Wizard was an arcane class that, you know, cast fireball and summon webs but they were a controller. A fighter was a person who had swords and shields and armor. They were a defender and their powers and all that other stuff supported that. 
Strike works a little differently. In Strike, you pick two things. You pick a class, which is a thematic grouping of powers, and then you pick a role, and it can be any role. So what does that mean? What does that look like? Well, imagine for a moment that your class, okay, is necromancer, right? Undead, dark energy, bones, summoning the dead, you know, all sorts of crazy stuff. Well, what if your character is a necromancer class and they are a controller as their role? Well, I think we can all agree that that would probably play out maybe a lot like the necromancer from Diablo, right? Summoning zombie walls and, you know, uh, having undead hands rip out of the ground and grab people to hold them in place because the controller role is going to give you the basic controller powers. It's going to let you function as a controller, but you have the ability to flavor it with all of your cool necromancer stuff. But you'll also have a whole host of necromancer powers that are coming from your class. But the role powers can be so that you can do your job as a controller. So what if we were a necromancer and we were a defender? Well, then maybe we're like a shadow knight or a dark knight, right? We're wearing, you know, uh, from Fabula Ultima, right? The, 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 I think it's called the dark knight um, or a, uh, can't remember what it's called in Fabio Ultima, but you know, uh, a Shadow Knight would be what it was called in EverQuest. Um, a Death Knight from World of Warcraft. Um, you're heavily armored. You're 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 channeling your inner Arthas, right, the Lich King. Um, you're very much a you know melee type character with these defendery abilities, but you're still a necromancer. So, you know, I think that in this game you have a lot of overlap because you can sort of mix and match the role and the class. Uh, oh, dark blade that, thank you. I, I need to, I need, it's been too long. I need to re, I need to re get familiar with my fabulous Ultima, especially since we're hopefully going to do an actual play of it here soon. Um, do the classes tend to favor different roles? I don't think so. I mean, it's entirely possible that like from a min max perspective, there might be classes that have, you look at a you know a bunch of powers on a class and might go oh I think that would work better for blaster than it would for controller that's entirely possible but um right maybe maybe your character is a vampire right yeah and and when they're hitting you know they're draining life um so in this game you get three actions on your turn you can basically move you can attack. And you can use a roll power, which means that every turn you have an opportunity to do something that really cements your role in the in the combat, in the fight. OK. Now, the game talks about what makes a good fight. You need to have goals <laughs> um, and, you know, don't make bad goals. <laughs> and, you know, talking about like. You know, this is this is a classic thing where it's like, know what your fight is about and try to make it interesting and try to make it fun. But again, we're going to start. We play on a grid. We roll initiative. We go in order, you know, of initiative, just like everybody else. OK, on your turn first, resolve any effects that end or trigger at the start of the turn, including taking ongoing damage. So just like fourth edition, you have ongoing damage. Then you take your action. This is the bulk of your turn. Then at the end of your turn, you roll a saving throw. And on a one through three, it's a failure. On a four through six, it's a success. In Pathfinder 2, this is like, you know, rolling the DC 15 flat check against persistent damage. But of course, everybody who plays fourth edition knows that uh, saving throws are just a flat DC 10 check. So it's not technically 50-50, but you're a little bit advantaged. But um, it is... Um, basically a 50% a chance that anything that's affecting you ends at the end of your turn. Uh, something that, you know, ends on a save. Um, on your turn, you have an action economy, you have act, attack action, move action, and a roll action, and as many free actions as make sense within the bounds of common sense. You can trade your attack action for a second action, but you cannot trade for a roll action. So this is where this is a little bit different than fourth edition. Um, you know, you can... Uh, you can't do your roll action multiple times per turn, but you could move twice. Many actions are free, such as closing a door. 
So a lot of the nickel and diming that you might see in some other games doesn't exist in this game. And then there's a couple things I really do like about this game too. Um, the hit points, they're not, they're not, you know, they're not hundreds of hit points like they might be in a, in a, in a typical game. Okay. Movement is done with squares, just like fourth edition D and D you don't gain 25 feet. You know, you gain five squares. Your movement will say five. Everything is done in squares. So you don't have to convert between, you know, well, number one, if you're using metric or you're using uh, feet, it doesn't matter imperial because it doesn't matter because it's just in squares. Secondly, um, there are opportunity attacks. Okay. And it says certain actions cause your opponents an opportunity. When you provoke an opportunity, your opponent takes the chance to strike at you and deal damage. When you are granted an opportunity, you may deal two damage to the enemy who triggered it. There's no attack roll. It's just automatic. You just take two automatically. All right. Um, and what triggers opportunity attacks? Well, making a ranged attack grants an opportunity attack to everybody adjacent to you. If you leave a square without shifting, you provoke an attack of opportunity to everybody around you. And some characters have special abilities, which let, let them use their opportunities in different ways. Ooh, wink, wink. But long story short, uh, it's quick. It's fast. If my character with a bow has two people in melee with him, but I decide to shoot my bow at the person you know on the other side of the battlefield, boom, I just take two, two. I take four damage instantaneously. There's no check. There's no roll. I, my character gets this opportunity. And that's pretty cool. It's fast. It's easy. Um, and it's not something – it's important, but I don't think we should – you know, be spending so much time making attack rolls for it. And by the way, uh, just like fourth edition D and D you have, you can only get one opportunity per creature, but you, you have tons, you have as many opportunities in the, as there are creatures in the game, in, in the fight. So you can't use an opportunity on, on one creature more than once in a turn. You know, you can't be like opportunity. Then he moves again, opportunity. And then he moves again, opportunity, but you could then use an opportunity on him, use an opportunity on the other guy, use an opportunity on the third guy. So again, that's very, that's fourth edition. Um, and then the game has powers just like fourth edition. So here's some examples. So let's take a look at the way this works. Actually, let's start by looking at the attack roll because I think that's the most important thing we can look at. Now the attack roll kind of looks similar to the, skilled skill roll. Okay. If you get a six, you get a critical hit and note what it says. It says you get the effect and it, and you get two times the blood drop symbol. What does, what does all that mean? Really simple. Everything in this game that is a power has two components. This is again for tactical combat. And I love this system. I, I wish I wish fourth edition D and D could be like rewritten to use this in this game. Every power has two components, the damage and the effect. Every power has some amount of damage and an effect. Some, some sort of game mechanical effect. So on a six on a critical hit, you get double the damage and the blood drop symbol on a power indicates that power's damage. So if the, you know, the power did three blood drops, that means it does three points of damage when you hit with it. So a critical hit doubles the damage and it also applies the effect written on the power. If you get a solid hit, which is a four or a five, you do the damage listed on the power and you deal the effect. Okay, so 50% of the time we're either doing we're doing damage and we're doing the effect. But remember before, on a roll of a three, we get that success with a cost. If you get three, you get a glancing hit. And now the player has to make a choice. Do they do damage or do they do the effect? I love this part of this chart. It is so cool because this allows us to have a high hit rate, right? I mean, you, you basically are hitting on a three, a four, a five, or a six. You're hitting 65% of the time. And it is possible in this game, by the way, to get like a plus one, which is a lot on a D6. So in some cases, you might be hitting a lot. So the problem with hitting a lot is how do you make that interesting? Well, the way that you do this is by obviously you get the critical effect, so it's awesome and crazy. But by having this glancing hit, 
it allows you to still let the player feel like they hit, but it makes them make this interesting choice. What's more important here, the damage or the effect? Now, what about a two and a one? Well, remember on our skilled roll, if we roll a two or a one, we don't get what we want, but there is always something that happens as a result. We're in combat, you know, things are already kind of dicey. Missing is its, its own flaw. So the game doesn't want to punish you too much, right? The fact that you missed is already sort of a penalty. When you miss in this game on a two or a one, you gain a miss token. And that's a good thing. Miss tokens can build up. Basically, imagine every time you miss, the GM gives you a poker chip or you take a poker chip from a, a pool, a bowl in the center of the table. You can spend your miss tokens on future attacks to add plus one to that attack. Remember, it's a D6 roll, people. It's a D6 roll. I can't even, you think a plus one, people say, oh, plus one's a big number in Pathfinder 2. You know how big a plus one is in a game that uses a D6, okay? So if you miss once or twice and you have two miss tokens, I mean, you're practically guaranteeing yourself uh, a hit or a critical hit on your next attack roll, essentially. So while missing still sucks, the consolation prize here is huge. But what if we roll a one? Well, we still get that miss token, but we also get a strike. And we've talked about strikes before, okay? It says, whenever you get a strike, make a note. You'll be counting how many of these you get. And at the end of the combat, having a lot of these leads to consequences for you, your PC personally, and your whole team. Remember, at the end of the fight, we're going to add up all the strikes that our team has gotten. Part of the way we get strikes is by getting bloodied, reduced to half hit points, or getting taken down to zero hit points, or even being completely taken out of the fight entirely. But the other way that we can earn strikes is by rolling ones. And so when we roll a one, this is like a very like womp, 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 womp moment, right? Like your character has done something. The enemy has done something that has allowed them to press an advantage and take an advantage. So this is a very similar chart to what we saw earlier in the game with the D6 on the skill roll. All right. So let's take a look at the powers. Well, for starters, just like they have in fourth edition D&D, there is the melee basic, the MBA, and the RBA, the range basic attack. And this is basically, you know, your shitty default power that hopefully you never have to use. Um, hell, in fourth edition, most of the time, you're making a melee basic attack is with an opportunity attack. But in this game, we don't even do that, right? Opportunity attacks are just automatic and they do two damage. So what does this do? You can use it at will. It's in green. That lets us know it's at will. And you can see here, it's got a couple of symbols. This symbol means the crossed swords means that this is a attack power. The ax means it's melee ranged. Probably could have used something different than that, but we'll forgive him for that. And the bow five means this is a ranged attack. And guess what the range is? Five squares, not five feet, five squares. Now, because this is the melee basic attack and you ideally would never ever use this, you can see that this attack, both of these attacks, do two points of damage and there is no effect, right? So this power sucks, but it's just supposed to be like the baseline power. So let's take a look at some more interesting powers. Let's take a look at this power, phantasms. Now this is at will, it's green. So this is, this is, a, this is a power, an attack that our character can use over and over again. Now we can see it's very similar to the range basic attack in that it has a five square range and it deals two points of damage but it also has an effect. The next ally to attack that target gets advantage on their D6 attack roll. Advantage, rolling 2D6 and taking the highest. And the attack table is exactly this. I don't exactly know what the odds are of this, but I mean, let me, let me, you, you, let me, let me, let me see here. Your, your chance of critically hitting uh, is one in six, which is 16% critical chance rate, right? But if somebody has to roll no sixes, then their chances of doing that are geez, times 0.83333 minus one. This gives you a 31% chance of critically hitting. Um, that's pretty good. And also a minuscule chance of missing. So that seems pretty good. It's simple, it's basic. 
but it's very powerful. Now, there's no flavor text here, okay? This is it. This is the power. This is, you either hate this or you love this. Even fourth edition D&D had that italicized play of flavor text. Thank God it's separate, right, from the mechanics. Fourth edition had its long laundry list of mechanics. Uh, this game does not do that. Uh, this game is a little bit bare when it comes to the details. And that's because phantasms could be illusion spells cast by your wizard. But it could also be like something from a sci-fi game. Or it could be something from a modern game. You know what I mean? Like, um, it could be that, you know, I'm using hollow projectors, right? It could be, you know, uh, it could be nanobots, right? It, it, the game has to be very vague because it could be used for anything. It could be a smoke grenade. Yeah. And this is what we talked about when we said the game is very generic and you have to do a lot of the heavy lifting in terms of bringing the game to life. You know, if your strike game turns into a phantasms for two, take advantage, like you're doing something wrong. You know, that that's, 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 a, that's a missed opportunity. You know, there's an opportunity here to you add your own fluff, right? Um, now, interesting. Remember, so phantasms we can see has damage and it has an effect. And that means that if we rolled a three on our D six, we would hit, but we would have to pick. Does it do two damage or does it grant our next ally to hit tack that target advantage? We'd have to pick which one is more important. Obviously, if we get a full hit, it's amazing. We get the damage and we get the effect. That's great. Um, but I think making that little, little extra, giving them the, the extra hit but where you have to make the choice. Very interesting. Very compelling. So here we see this sort of pink, pink, purpley pink color. That means it's an encounter power. And yes, just like fourth edition, this means that you can use this power once a fight, once an encounter. Here's a melee attack. We see the little ax symbol. It does two damage and the effect is also two damage. And you, the character who's doing it, regain three hit points. So if we get a full hit with our life drain, it's going to do four points of damage and we're going to heal for three. That's pretty sweet. Um, but here's one that is not a melee attack, nor is it a ranged attack. OK, it's still a it still uses our attack action, you know, that basically your standard action. This is called the perfect chance. One ally within 10 squares makes an attack with advantage. So this is this is your classic warlord power, right? Now, it's called the perfect chance, but the idea is you would theme this however you wanted to do it. You know, if you were playing some cyberpunk situation, you know, you might call this like, um, you know, a uh, friendly brain hack, you know, or something. I don't know. Like, you know, you like you, you temporarily take control of their servos and circuits and, you know, get attack through them or something like that. That, that might be what it is in D&D fourth edition and the warlord. You know, you might call this, you know, war commander shout you know, or, or war leaders charge or whatever. And you might say, you know, you have advantage because of my stirring cry to victory and battle. And I, I inspire you and you push yourself forward and you make another attack and you have it with advantage. The theme and the flavor comes from you. All right. So these are just examples, by the way. Um, so that is, that is the, the basics of tactical combat in this game. Okay. Um, and, uh, we'll, we'll get into some other stuff here, you know, as well, but, um, let me just kind of catch up here with, uh, with the, the chat, see if there's anything here. Uh, it's so much easier to understand abilities when they're written like that. The fluff in Pathfinder and 5e drives me mad, you know, but people love it, Shadram. And, you know, people even criticize fourth edition for being too dry this is very dry, um, you know, because there's no fluff to this at all. And I think that that hurts. the. I love it, but I think that it hurts the game. You know, not that not that many people knew or saw this game, but it, it makes people because some people don't want to make up the fiction. Some people don't want to make up what their power does. They just want it to be the thing that it is. You know, um, let me make my fluffy bullshit my fluffy bullshit. I agree with you, Grim Prism. I mean, I've even seen. GMs like on Reddit and stuff. I've seen like where like somebody was like, I wanted to retheme my mat. You know, my character is like a 
Necromancer, but I have Magic Missile because it's a great spell. And I wanted to retheme the Magic sp- Missile as like spectral flying skulls that laugh maniacally. And the GM said no, because that's not what Magic Missile does, right? And it's kind of like the GM is right, technically. But it's also one of those things where it's like, <sighs> it doesn't really matter. Well, it might make them think that they're more powerful than they are, and they might not recognize that it's magic missile because it's flying skulls. And it's like this is where you're you're you know you're sort of losing the forest for the trees, right? Um, <laughs> fourth edition DD had the funniest italicized flavor text, which read, "You leap out from the shadows and accuse your target of heresy." That sounds like a later fourth edition power, but I could be wrong. Uh, but yeah, that is pretty funny. Um, but yes, it does lead to a lot of debates about what's in the flavor text. And yeah, once you read the flavor text once, most of the time you're not, you're playing the game at a certain point. You just want to know the mechanics and what this thing does, you know? Um, is there, is there some kind of value that compares a text's words count, word count to the amount of time it wastes? Brevity? Yeah, brevity. You know, what do they say? Brevity is the soul of wit, right? Because strike may can ramble, but it still has a really high score there. Yes. I mean, it, it, it's, it's words are very carefully chosen, you know? Um, and yeah, when fluff gets integrated as an effect, it becomes problematic. I agree. Um, all right. So what else can we do in combat? Well, again, note, uh, that, uh, Everybody can uh, charge. Everybody can rally. If you're playing fourth edition, you know that this is basically second wind, except unlike in fourth edition where it takes your turn, this doesn't take any action, which is pretty sweet. You may only use this on your turn, but you may use it at any point during your turn, even while you are incapacitated, dominated, or under any other status. Spend an action point, regain four hit points, and regain the use of one of your encounter powers from your class that you have expended. Uh, We kind of skipped over action points, but action points are a resource uh, that you can accumulate. Uh, And so basically, rather than being limited to once per fight, action points kind of serve as like action points and healing surges. But not only does it give you back hit points, it gets you back an encounter power. And it doesn't take your turn. It's no action. You just have to have an action point to spend. That's pretty sweet. Also, a character can assess. Now, we haven't gotten to this yet. The little three people icon, that's your roll action. So you could move and attack, and you could also still have an action left to assess. You'll love this, okay? Roll a die, a D6. I mean, that's the only die in the game. Roll a D6 and ask the GM that many questions from the list below. That's it. <laughs> and, you know, uh, the GM has to answer truthfully, you know, honest, what honesty demands. If you roll a three, you could ask three questions. You could say, and by the way, anybody who's heard me talk about Dungeon World and Power by the Apocalypse can very clearly see the influence here about this stuff here, you know, who is really in charge? Uh, you know, what can I use against my enemies? Are there any hidden doors or traps? You know, it's like, so it's like you're fighting a monster and you're like, maybe you're fighting two different monsters and you roll a four on the D six and you go, how many hit points does that monster have? How many hit points does that monster have? How would you summarize its powers? How would you summarize its powers? Boom. And that's it. And there's no check. The check is how many questions do you get to ask? That's it. And this isn't even your full action, by the way, people. This is your roll action. So you can still move and attack and do this. Um, And it says, uh, you'll often use this when you have no compelling reason to use powers from your roll, or if you suspect there may be hidden enemies. You might also even get a free use of it before the combat if the GM deems it appropriate. I mean, that's awesome. Um, Now, again, this is very clearly inspired by four, you know, powered by the apocalypse. So there's this whole section here about the fiction is what takes precedence. If there's ever a debate between the fiction and the mechanics, the
the fiction takes precedence. Yes, I know what that power says, but I think we can all agree that in the fiction, it makes no sense that it could do that. In this case, the game rules are stating that the fiction takes precedence. This is a a significant departure for a lot of games. This is much more of an indie idea, right? The fiction first gaming, even though we're playing a tactical game. Um, so by the way, you always start the combat with maximum hit points. That's 10 by default. There's no healing. You always start a fight at 10 hit points. Full stop. But where's the attrition? Well, again, Remember, when you take hit point damage and you become bloodied or you get taken out, you gain strikes. And after and after the fight, depending on how many strikes your side has accumulated, you might owe them major or minor concessions, which could include your character being messed up. Uh, could be include your character dying. <laughs> um, and if you've played Burning Wheel, which I know probably no one has, but if you played Burning Wheel or you've played Mouse Guard or you played Torchbear, you are aware that concessions can be a little weird, a little narrative. Like, for example, let me give you an example. We have a fight. Okay. Uh, let's let's pick. It's versus like, you know, a red dragon. A strong thing, right? Me and the party. And I'm playing that, uh, you know, that dark blade. I'm playing the necromancer defender, right? I'm the dark knight I'm the, you know, heavily armored necromancer scald guy. But, you know, I've, I'm trying to redeem myself for my past mistakes. And we're fighting this red dragon, right? And people are getting bloodied. People are getting dropped to zero, okay? And we're accumulating a lot of strikes. And we're rolling dice. We're maybe rolling some ones. We're getting more strikes. Throughout the entire course of the fight, my necromancer defender... I never, I never get taken out. I never even get brought to zero. Maybe I get bloodied, you know, but my character never goes down to zero hit points. I am never knocked unconscious. But at the end of the fight, we beat the dragon. It's a win, but we have so many strikes that, you know, the GM is basically like, you know, you guys owe a major concession. Uh, you know, it's a Pyrrhic victory. Right. If this thing is smog, you know, the GM is basically like you guys killed smog, but he destroyed the entire town and everyone, almost everyone is dead. Right. And your death knight goes, GM, I have a proposal for you. Now remember, your character never got even got taken out in the fight. What if instead of that being the cost, the town gets destroyed? What if I sacrifice myself instead? And you might be like, but how is that possible? He didn't even get knocked unconscious. Because the fight is just the way that we get to, let's decide what happened, really happened in the fight. I don't know if this is making, I don't know if this makes sense, but it's like, <laughs> it's almost like we're playing a mini game instead of rolling dice to then decide what that narrative thing is that happened. Right. So like, everyone's like, you know, everyone's like, Oh dude, no, what? And you're like, I'm like, listen, you know, I need to do this. This is a, this is the, this is the only way that a character like me who has so much blood on his, you know, soul, um, can pot ever potentially redeem himself. If I have the, if, if the GM is willing to accept my offer and instead of the town and all of its people being destroyed by the dragon that we were not, strong enough to stop. I mean, we killed him, but not before he destroyed it. If I have the opportunity to stop that by offering my character's life, I want to do it. And the GM says, okay, I, I accept your, you know, I accept that offer, right? It's like a negotiation. You know, the GM understands the players owe a pretty big concession and the one player is willing to throw down his life. Again, very similar to, to surrender versus sacrifice from Fabula Ultima. And that's when you kind of narrate the end of that fight. Exactly. Exactly, cuddly zombie. The GM can narrate that right at the end of the fight. With its dying breath, the dragon has one final ultra fireball attack headed right for the town. And that's when the Dark Knight, you know, leaps into the way, you know. Or, you know, the, the, the hit points are all abstract and relative anyways. Sure, your Dark Knight never went unconscious, but maybe he was fatally wounded in the opening minutes 
of that fight. And he's just been hiding it and bleeding out the entire fight. And so narratively, you know, the dragon crashes to the ground. The town is totally fine. Maybe there's a couple buildings on fire. Maybe a couple things got smashed, but by and large, the people have been saved and everyone's kind of like ready to high five each other. And then someone notices, you know, the steady flow of blood staining out from beneath the dark armor of the shadow Knight. And it's like, you look to him and it's like, you know, and then, and that's when you realize how badly he's hurt, you know, and you see that the back of his armor is completely rent through you and that the dragon had just impaled him with his claws like a long time ago. And it's like, you know, why didn't you say anything? He's like, you know, I, I had my penance and I had my, I had my choice and I made it. And for the first time in my life, I'm, I'm proud to say that I made the right choice. Go on, my friends. Today is a good day. And then he dies and everyone's like, holy shit, that was awesome. <laughs> and, and the player's happy with it. That was his call. That was your choice. So this is a way to turn tactical miniature grid combat into a narrative device. It is really, really, really smart. <laughs> now, to be clear, Burning Wheel, this is pretty much all taken from Burning Wheel. Except Burning Wheel doesn't use tactical gridded miniature combat burning wheel uses its paper rock and scissors conflict system which i'll be completely honest torchbearer uses the same thing mouse guard uses the same thing and i'll be completely honest with you i hate it uh i would much prefer this you know and it's really funny i, I never i never got smith to play this game and smith loved torchbearer he loved mouse guard but the one problem he had same as me is he hated the conflict system and i always felt bad that he never got a chance to do this because i was like this is basically torchbearer's but with a combat system that works in the context of it, but it's a tactical miniature combat instead of a, you know, paper, rock, and scissors putting down your cards thing. Um, so that is where this game, I think, ha you know, really expands the scope of what a tactical miniature combat can be. Sure, it has other things in it. Like, for example, if it's a gridded miniature combat, if you're flanking, okay, you are both adjacent to the target and on opposite sides. You both have advantage on melee attacks against it. You thought advantage was, well, you thought flanking was good in Pathfinder 2. It gives you advantage here and on a D6, okay? If someone's prone, you have advantage. If you are hidden from your target or if you charge, you have advantage, okay? Now, um, at the same time, if your character is winded or exhausted, those were those costs and conditions from earlier in the in the game we talked about in the stream, you might have disadvantage to your attack rolls in the first round of combat and so on and so forth, okay? Cover attacks. If you have cover, attacks have disadvantage, right? It's very basic. It's very simple. Um, but again, it you know, and the game does have tactical components, right? Like you can have cover, you have take cover, all this stuff here. Blocking line of sight, you know, lots of stuff here. Intervening cover, like a lot of these rules are basically taken from fourth edition, you know, how do you drawing a line of sight between you and your target, between your between your square on the grid and their square on the grid. I mean, if everybody's played any sort of Pathfinder 2, D&D, fourth edition, D&D, third edition, you know, you know what all this stuff is, all right? Um, so here's, a glossary of tactical combat terms. There's conditions like dominated and distracted and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, bloodied, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it has marked just like fourth edition D&D &D does, okay? And it has, they don't call them minions. It has goons is what they're called. Um, and uh, so very similar, you know, to thing. And again, the way a goon works is, Oh, does this sound familiar? Does this sound like, I don't know. Does this sound like, uh, what's it called? Not ah, real monsters. Flea mortals. Does this sound like MCDM's minion rules? Sure does to me. Goons are more fragile than standard monsters. They have a hit point threshold. And if the first damage they take does more than that value, they are taken out. Otherwise, they are considered bloodied and are taken out the next time they take damage, regardless of the amount. Cool. Cool. Basically, a minion, if you do enough damage to it, dies immediately. And if you don't do enough damage to it, it will always die on the next hit. Easy, simple, fun. I used to use a rule like this 
uh, when I wanted to kind of deal with like, I wanted to have like stronger minions. And so basically the way I had it done was in uh, fourth edition, I did a little differently is that you needed two hits to kill a minion. I only did this for like um, Northern reaches was originally a fourth edition campaign that I ran, but I did this for Northern reaches. Basically if you critically hit a minion, they would be dead. If you hit the minion, they would essentially be bloodied. And I used to use these little red discs that I would uh, put under a, a miniature to indicate that it was bloodied. So I would just bloody the minion. And then it meant if it takes one more hit at all, it's dead. And so I, this is very similar to what I used to do during that. Um, anyone else having buffering issues? Uh, I've been seeing that happen more re often recently. Yeah, you know, YouTube has been having a lot of problems. You know, I, I'm, I'm looking here at my drop frames. Like everything here is good on my end. Um, but it, it, I have noticed that YouTube has had some, some problems here, but on my end, it looks good. So it could just be your local server or whatever, but I think YouTube has just been kind of sucking lately. Um, you know, you have weaknesses, you have vulnerable, you know, all this other stuff here. Okay. Um, so when you choose a character class, you choose your class, you choose your role and you pick a feat. Unless contradicted or modified by other choices, every character has 10 hit points and a speed of six. And then they have this big section here about re-skinning. This is the idea that you can use the mechanics as written, but change the narration of how those mechanics are enacted to suit your character. In other words, make it whatever you want it to be. It doesn't matter. The flavor is unimportant. What's important are the mechanics. And what's important is that something like you is, you know, uh, you know, Break this, you know, break that down and break it down into something that means sense, makes sense to you. Um, then he talks about leveling up as you gain, as you level up, uh, you, you get more stuff from your class. You get more stuff from your role. Generally speaking, you will add to your role powers at even levels and you'll add to your class powers at odd levels. And at every other level, you get a feat. It says when to level up by default. All characters level up at the same time when it is narratively appropriate to do so. This could be after fixing their quest or simply after a long period of downtime in which they had to improve their abilities. Level one should be fast. And as soon as everyone's comfortable with the rules, you can move to level two. But note, if you just watched uh, the stream from last night, frankly, this is, this is the style of this person, right? This is not an RPG for beginners. Frankly, you could just use about any leveling system that you like here. If you want to use old-fashioned experience points, that's fine. Leveling is not something that ties into the mechanical reward cycle of this game. Remember, I've talked about this before, how for some games, the XP rewarding is part of the mechanical reward cycle. He's saying this is not part of the mechanical reward cycle. So you're free to use any leveling system that encourages the kind of behavior that you want to see in your game. What gets rewarded gets repeated, right? What gets measured gets managed. XP systems, reward systems are all about consciously or unconsciously rewarding a certain type of behavior. That means don't give out exclusive experience exclusively or mostly for killing monsters unless you want your game to be killing monsters. This is funny because we were just talking about this yesterday. One of my favorite experience systems is keys from the shadow of yesterday. Check it out and see what you think. You could also check out Lady Blackbird, which is done by John Harper, and John Harper used keys in Lady Blackbird as well. The most important thing is that experience points is, systems are not necessary, and the game has none by default. Only introduce it if you want to promote certain behaviors, because that is what XP systems are for, is to promote and encourage certain types of behavior. Um, okay, so you know, let's, let's, let's go through this example of play. I think that that's important. You know, it's almost nine o'clock here. We're, we're going to end up, we're going to end soon here, but we're going to finish talking about the classes. We're going to finish. Well, we'll, we'll show some examples from the classes and some of the roles, but all right. So the necromancer uses her move action to gain her speed, which is six in squares of movement. Okay. She then moves three squares to end next to the goop. All right, the goop is apparently this little slime monster. So this little shadowy necromancer moves one space, two spaces, and three spaces. Now that she is adjacent, she can attack. She spends her attack action and uses this power. Terrifying Visage. It's an at-will, melee range. It does two damage, and the effect 
Target must use its move action on its turn to move its speed away from you, or it takes three damage. Now, the Necromancer rolls a three, which means she can either deal two damage or apply the effect. Remember, three is a glancing hit. If you get a four or a five, you get to do the damage and the effect. But on a three, you have to pick. The Necromancer picks effect. The Goop is terrified of her and must spend its action to flee from her on its next turn. However, that Necromancer is the class. The Necromancer, she also has a role. Because she has the controller role, she has the following feature. This is something that she gets from being the uh, controller. Whenever, whenever you roll a three, four, five, or six on an attack roll, you may choose to either slow the target until the end of its next turn or to slide the target three squares. So if a controller hits, they can either slow the target down, meaning it can't move very fast, or they can slide them three squares. She elects to slide the goop two squares, putting him directly between her and her ally, Hippocampia. So this little uh, sea creature here must be her ally, Hippocampia. So she moves the goop, right? Here's the goop right down here. She moves the goop. She can move it up to three squares. She slides it one, two. So now she's moved the goop in between her and her ally. And remember, she also applied the effect, which is that the target must move away from her on its next turn. Um, that Now, that's just her role. That's her controller power, okay? She elects to slide the goop two squares, putting him directly between her and her ally, Hippocampia. On Hippocampia's turn, she will have advantage if she attacks the goop because she and the necromancer are flanking. Finally, the necromancer uses her roll action to use the following power on the goop. This is at will with a range of 10 squares. The target is weakened until the end of its next turn. Now, weakened is one of the conditions in the game. You know, you, you do need to know some of the conditions in the game. Weakened is when a weakened creature attacks and does damage, sum up all of its damage from all of its attack and then half it rounding down, right? So if you would do seven damage, you would do 3.5, which is half, round down, seven damage would become three damage. Five damage would become two damage and so on. That's what weakened does. So here's what our necromancer did on her turn on what is arguably a bad roll, which is a three. She moved up. She attacked the goop. She got a glancing hit. She moved. She, she made it that the goop on its turn is going to have to move away from her or take three damage. The goop then got slid into a flanked position with her ally. And then she weakened it so that if it does attack on its turn, it's going to do half damage. All right. So now the goop is weakened and will do half damage on any attacks next turn. Using a ranged attack would grant an opportunity to adjacent enemies like the goop. But the sap strength is a roll power, not an attack power. See, this does, it doesn't have the little, it, has, it doesn't have the sword, crossed swords icon. It has the, the three people, three heads icon, which is a roll power. Only attack powers provoke opportunities. Um, so roll powers do not grant opportunities. Now, she still has three movement points left. So it's a little, this is different than fourth edition. In fourth edition, you have to use all of your move at once. This is a bit more like fifth edition, where when you use a move action, you get a bank of speed that you can use throughout your turn. So in this case, she still has three squares of movement. But if she moved, she would grant the goop an opportunity attack and her ally would lose advantage. So she's going to stay where she is and she's done. All right, a few minutes later, after Hippocampia has taken her turn, and let's hope Hippocampia attacked the goop on the flank with advantage, it's the goop's turn. The GM has been thinking about what to do during Hippocampia's turn. The goop seems to have two reasonable choices. The goop could trade down its attack action for a move action and use that to shift. So now it is only next to the necromancer not to both the Necromancer and Hippocampia. Remember, shifts do not 
grant opportunities, a.k.a. five footsteps. Then it does have to spend its move action to move away from the necromancer, and then it would take two points of damage from the opportunity. But the goop could also spend its attack action and try to attack one of the players, either the necromancer or hippocampia. But of course, it'll do half damage because it's weakened. But then it either stays put and takes three damage from the necromancer's frightened power or it has to move, in which case both people will get to attack it and deal four damage. So this goop is in a really bad situation. This was the necromancer's plan all along, of course. Instead of dealing two damage immediately, she has put the enemy in a spot where it now has to choose between taking three damage or four damage or only taking two damage, but then it has to give up its attack completely. So I think you can all appreciate that that was pretty tactical. You know, there was a lot of movement. There was a lot of squares. There was a lot of working with your allies, positioning the enemy, using your role move, using your class move. And that was just the one necromancer's turn. It feels like a pretty tactical game, if you ask me. So again, um, and that's, that's an example of combat. Now, just like with the conditions, in the classes, they give you, now again, this game, my understanding is that uh, the author of the game had some family medical issues that came up shortly after he released the game. He, I think he intended to keep producing and publishing expansions and uh, supplements, but he never did. So there's really, now there might be some people out there, I don't know, in drive through RPG who have put, uh, put together some additional classes, but in the book, there's basically an idea of like, you, you, you should make your own classes. And you know, here's like eight, here's like nine classes. So in the game, they give you, necromancer they give you the duelist they give you the archer they give you the martial artist they give you the magician they give you the warlord and as an example where people can get really turned off by this game's language and i'll be honest with you uh, you know 10 years ago a lot of my players at the time might have been turned off by this language too i don't think i mind it as much but I think things are a little bit different now. Like, for example, the Warlord has this power. It's their at will. So at level one, you choose three of the following at will powers. So they have one, two, three, four, five. They have six powers to choose from. You get to pick three. And one of them is called hit this thing. Nobody should call like they're not. The power isn't called hit this thing. Because it wants you, in your fiction, in your game, to be going, hey, you, hit this thing. I mean, you could totally do that, okay? You could totally do that if you're playing a very beer and pretzel style game. Why do they call this hit this thing? Because you are a human being, and without even reading this power, you know what this power does. Because it could be called something like Warmaster's Judgment. That would sound really cool. Okay. Number one, it might not apply for the fiction that we're in. We might be in a sci-fi setting. We might be in a modern setting. So Warlord's Justice doesn't sound right. But also at the end of the day, Warlord's Justice doesn't tell you anything about what this power really does. Calling it hit this thing is a great way to communicate quickly what this power is all about. And sure enough, one ally within 10 squares makes a melee basic or range basic attack um morale boosting punching bag enumerate its weaknesses knock it off balance come help me over here again very, <laughs> there's there's very little flavor here it's it's almost kind of cheesy but it's because it's just supposed to be simple and easy and you are supposed to flavor it and skin it reskin it Okay. You also get some encounter powers. Like you hit like a baby. You should not call it. You hit like a baby. Okay. <laughs> but that is what it is. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> lead the charge, a bigger punching bag, right? Leave them exposed. So all of these things are the powers that your character would get over the course of the game. And again, you're choosing, you know, a couple at, at wills, an encounter, another encounter. You get to add some additional stuff here uh, for your class. And this is the warlord. And then there's a magician, you know, 
And then there's the bombardier. You know, this is like their kind of like their alchemist, you know, a danger to her others and the self, right? But this, you could completely reskin this and your bomb, your character that is the bombardier could be like a dragon. And instead of throwing grenades, uh, it's, you know, breathing fire or spitting fireballs could totally do that. That would be totally valid. So those are the classes and you're going to get a number of powers from your class. Okay. Is this another 10 level system? Grim, I believe it is another 10 level system. But you also get to pick a role. Okay. Your role defines your place on the team and your goals in combat. Do you focus on damage on one target? Do you affect many allies at once? Do you protect your allies? Do you enable your allies? Or do you lock down the most dangerous foe? In this game, you pick your role separately from your class. Some classes lean towards some roles. There we go, answering that question. Some classes lean towards some roles more than others. And certainly, there are synergies to be found. It is my goal that all classes should be viable with almost every role. Perhaps the duelist doesn't make a great blaster, but that's okay because it's a great striker, controller, or defender, and it works fine as a leader. There really are no bad combination. Um, so you get the blaster, which is all about dealing damage to lots of enemies all across the map. So fourth edition had four roles, controller, striker, controller, striker, leader, defender. Strike has five roles. It has blaster, which is like the AOE damage. Striker, which is the super high single target damage. Leader, which is the support and healing. Defender, which is the defender. And then it has controller as a fifth role, which is not about doing AOE damage. It's about locking down. It's about control. It's about slowing, debuffing, that kind of thing. So the blaster. Remember, you're going to pick a class, right? Your character could be an archer blaster or a warlord blaster or a magician blaster or a bombardier blaster or a summoner blaster or a necromancer blaster. What makes you a blaster is you get some of these roll powers for your class. And like one of them is you get this multi-target boost. If you attack with a power that has a range of X, you can instead make it a burst one, which means in fourth edition terms, you target a square and burst one means you target that square and every square that is adjacent to it, every square in one direction. A burst two, uh, all bursts in fourth edition and in strike are squares. Um, because if, it, if you have a burst, you know, if you target a square and you go burst one, that is a three by three square. If it's a burst two, right, you're going out two squares in each direction, including diagonal, it becomes a five by five square. Anyways, um, so right off the bat, this class can upgrade and turn their ranged attacks into multi-target blasts, right? Into big explosion, all right? Um, and, you know, there's other, obviously there was, there's other abilities that the blaster gets. They can, they can choose to gain precision so that they do, you know, can be more accurate. Um, they can choose to gain, you know, in, different abilities and different moves things, but these are all role powers that they can do that makes them really good at doing a bunch of damage and a bunch of AOE stuff. Okay. And again, they have really clever names like multi-target boost, which becomes improved multi-target boost, which becomes super multi-target boost. Again, you could call this, you know, um, you know, I don't know, satellite, link up precision if you're playing like some cyberpunk game you you know but you probably don't want to leave it called super multi-target boost um controller we kind of saw this a little bit in the example because the necromancer that they gave was a controller a controller is all about locking down a single target with nasty effects a controller can stack debilitating effects on a single target better than any other role the controller's joy comes from curtailing the boss's ability to fight back while their teammates do the damage. So again, we saw this sap strength before, but the controller can weaken their foes. They can uh, uh, make them stop their movement, right? 
They can, it literally is a power called save or suck, <laughs> which is to say they become stunned, right? Um, save or die. Yikes. All right. So single target locking and debilitating debuffs. Defender defends and marks and, you know, does all the stuff that, that defenders do. Leaders, guess what they do? They heal and they grant people move actions and they grant people, uh, you know, bonuses and buffs and they help out their team. Like <laughs> they, they have an ability called walk it off, right? As an encounter power. But then they have one called walk it off harder. <laughs> so you can see where a group could either, if a group is using these terms, it's going to be very beer and pretzels, very funny. My, and I, again, I think this game suffers from this. People read this and go, oh, this is so stupid. Look, there's no flavor text. It's so cheesy. It's like, you know, no, you know, no, but it's telling you what it is. Remember that walk it off power that you had? Well, this is walk it off harder. And it does exactly what it, you think it says on the tin, which is great. And then lastly, we have striker. And the striker is all about just doing a ton of damage. Um, so again, uh, at level one, you could pick damage boost. And whenever you roll a two to five on an attack, you deal an extra point of damage to the target. So even on a two, which is normally a miss, the striker does at least a point of damage. But if you roll anything higher, you do your normal damage and you do an extra damage. But if you roll a six, you actually do two extra points of damage. And by the way, that's at level one. By the time you get to level eight, you have super damage boost. And even on a two, three, four, or five, you deal three extra damage. And on a six, you deal six extra damage. That's also after doubling the damage from a crit. So can a high level striker kill a foe in one hit with a critical hit? You bet your ass. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, hell, look at this encounter power. Power up strike. Deal 15, 15 extra damage if you hit with your next attack. And again, the hit points in this game are, you know, in the, in the lows. Um, so that is the rolls. And then you get a feat and there's not, it's not a huge list of feats. There's some feats for your rolls. There's some feats for your classes. Um, but by and large, again, like a lot of things in this game, there's not a ton of you know, of, of what's the word I'm looking for of choices. You know, we're, we're used to fourth edition. We're used to Pathfinder two, where we just have hundreds of choices to make. That's not the case here. This game doesn't get deep enough, you know, to do that. Um, but you, you know, it only goes to level 10. You're only going to get five feats anyway. So, you know, having a huge list doesn't really matter that much. Um, so this is, th then there's a section all about the monsters, and how to, you know, how to build monsters, how to design combats, how to design monsters. Guess what? They're going to talk to you here. This is very much like fourth edition. You get one standard monster per player up to four players. So in other words, if there's four players, you have four standard monsters or there's elites or there's solos, which they actually, I think they call boss monsters in this game. Um, and, you know, they give you like templates so that you can build your monsters, okay? Um, and it's, I know it's a little, you know, wonky, but it, it, the game gives you a ton of templates that you can use to build monsters on the fly or, you know, with a little bit of prep. Um, so you can make generalist monsters, which are just kind of like your general all-purpose monsters. There's specialist monsters that might, you know, like you might make a drainer monster or a controller monster or the brute, right? the charger, the heckler. So you have all these different templates. And again, you can reskin all the monsters. You can change them around. You can do all this other stuff. So like, you know, this is, this is kind of all the, the ideas here of, of these monsters. So let's see if we have anything here. Um, and then there's a whole section about how to build monsters. What, you know, what hit points should they have, et cetera, et cetera. You know, um, Standard monsters will have hit points equal to six plus twice their level. So that means a level one monster is going to have eight hit points. Remember, players start with 10. 
So if you're higher level, remember we saw that level eight power. So a level eight monster would have eight times the level, 16 plus six. So they'd have like 20, 22 hit points. Remember that striker power let you add plus 15 damage on top of the damage that you were already doing. So you could easily see that if the striker hits and does their extra points of damage and they add their 15 points of damage, they could basically kill a standard monster from full in one hit. And, you know, I, I think that's okay if you're a striker. I mean, that's what, you, that's what you're there to do, right? You're, you're there to fuck, wreck shit. I love it. Um, and then, you know, he talks about how, like, this is all just generic and kind of wishy-washy. Or you could get super precise. You know, you, you add extra level. You worry more about the balance. You go through each of the different things. And, you know, you determine what tier the power should be. Basically, you can be kind of hand-wavy about it. And the game says it doesn't really matter. Um, and again, just tons of information about how to build monsters. The problem? Yeah. The problem is they don't really have a bestiary, right? So it's, you know, it's kind of like you have to build it yourself. And that could be kind of problematic. And then they have like a FAQ section about building monsters. Like, what do I do if I keep my players keep losing? What do I do if my players keep winning and I want it to be more challenging? And then they give you a lot of advice about how you should maybe be tweaking your monsters or building them differently. What if the difficulty level is fine, but combat is taking too long? Here are some things, you know, like anyone who's played fourth edition will say, don't use more than one soldier, maybe two, right? Because if you have a lot of soldiers in the group, they don't do a lot of damage and they have high ACs and pretty good hit points. It takes a long time to go through it. So that is, and there's a bunch of optional rules as well in the game. It's by no means like, you know, short. Um, but, uh, and they've got some other random additional information in there and stuff like that. There's a lot more to this game that we did not cover. Um, but it, that is the basics of it, you know? And, um, I'm trying to find something here. Oh, here we go. Sample monsters. All right. I think they have a, a dragon. Here we go. Okay. So they use the term Titan to be like uh, an example of a monster. Yeah. Titans are built like champions, but they have an extra thing or two. Their huge size can make it important for characters to target specific body parts. They can have multiple forms, right? Titans are basically boss, you know, think, you know, boss monsters with different phases and I'm going to attack its arm and I'm going to attack its head, you know, whatever. So here's the dragon, right? So here's the dragon. The dragon is an enemy with multiple parts and it's miss trigger gives it terrain alterations. I should note that a lot of monsters, particularly like the elite and the, the boss type monsters have something called a miss trigger, which is if the players attack them and miss the monster gets to do something. Basically that way the combat feels way more dynamic because you're probably not going to have, it's, it's almost kind of like a reaction, but it occurs when the players miss anyways, um, damage to the head, body and claws counts towards the dragon's total hit points while damage to the wings and tail do not each of the left and right claws, the tail, the head and the body and the wings all have HP thresholds of 24. Here is a breakdown of what the dragon loses as you take out its body parts. If you take out its wings, it loses its flyer ability. If you take out its tail, it loses its lashing tail effect. If you take out both claws, it loses its, it's dangerous reach, it's claw swipe, and it's miss trigger. The head, strong will, bite, swallow, and fiery breath. And if you deal 24 damage to the body, it opens up a gap in its scales and the body no longer has resist two to all damage. But other than that, the creature has 72 hit points because it's supposed to do the work of you know four or five monsters. It takes up a four square by four square space on our tactical combat grid. It has a speed of 10 squares. So let's see what our Titan has, this dragon Titan. Now it's level seven, so it's high level, but not like the end of, end of the game. All right, the Titan. This is just a generic ability. You always succeed on saving throws. You are immune to effects that hinder your movement, and you take three turns per round on initiative counts seven, five, and three. 
Your scales resist two damage, but the wings only resist one and the head resists three. So you you basically have DR because of your thick scales. Wings, you start the combat with the flying status and can gain the flying status whenever you take a move action. You have reached three with your claw swipe and your opportunities do two extra damage. So his opportunities do four damage, not two. Strong-willed, if you would be dazed, stunned, panicked, dominated, or incapacitated, you first make a saving throw to try to avoid the effect. You do not automatically succeed at these throws. Keep in mind, you always succeed on your saving throws, which happen at the end of your turn. What this means is if you try to dominate or stun or daze the dragon, it gets an immediate 50-50 chance to shake it off. If it does land, though, the dragon will lose an action. It will lose, you know, it'll be stunned for a turn. But then at the end of its turn, it will automatically pass the saving throw and be rejoined into it. So it's basically like you have a 50-50 chance of taking one action away, which I think is pretty fair. Uh, enormous, you are immune to forced movement, including pushes, pulls, slides, and throws. And if you do get slowed, your speed drops to five, not to two. Lastly, we get into the attacks. Lashing tail. If an enemy within three squares of you grants an opportunity, you may knock it prone in addition to dealing damage. Whenever an enemy within three squares of you moves closer to you, it must make a saving throw. If it fails, it is knocked prone. Lashing tail, pretty brutal. Recharge. If you roll a five or a six when you make a single target attack or a six if you make a multi-target attack, you get to recharge one of your encounter powers. What's your encounter power? Fiery breath. But what else can I do in my turn? Well, I can claw swipe for three damage and an effect of two damage. So basically, if I hit, I do five. I can bite, which does three damage, but the effect is it grabs the target. And remember, if I roll a three, I could either do the three damage or I could grab the target. I get to choose which one I want. Swallow. I deal three damage to any enemies I have grabbed. If this brings them below zero hit points, you swallow them and they are taken out of the fight. Fiery breath doesn't just create a cone. It actually creates a three square by seven square zone adjacent to us. Make this attack against everyone in the zone. And if it hits, it does three damage and they catch on fire and they are doing ongoing three damage. Yikes. And lastly, at will, as a reaction, our miss trigger. If an enemy misses us with an attack, we chuck scenery. Yes, folks, that is the mechanical effect. We grab a nearby pillar or boulder and we hurl it at the attacker. We deal three damage, knock them prone, and potentially change the terrain nearby. This would be very difficult for a lot of GMs to run because it would literally say, grab a pillar or a boulder and hurl it. It deals three damage and it changes the terrain. What the fuck does that mean? But the truth of the matter is, if you know what you're doing, this is awesome. This is what you want fighting a dragon to feel like, right? This is where a player rolls up and they miss, you know, and, and the, you know, the dragon like, throws its tail around and just crashes its tail down and the ground cracks underneath you and a, the pillars all collapse on top of your character and you're knocked prone, you're trapped under a pillar and now you know, you're writing on your dry erase bar this big, you know, with a black dry erase marker, this big crevice and you describe how like the ground is cracking open or maybe there's a nearby building. Remember we were talking about fighting the dragon? Maybe the, a player misses and the dragon turns and it uses its claw and just swipes out the side of a building and like a spray of bricks and lumber goes flailing into your character and you're trapped beneath a burning piece of the building and then there's women and children inside of the house which has been torn asunder by the dragon's fury. It, it just adds to the the dynamics of the fight and just makes it pop. So, and then we also talked a little bit about this in our, what makes enemies and monsters cool. We talked about unfair monsters, things like a Medusa that can just turn you to stone, but understand that this is not a monster that you're just supposed to randomly fight and treat it like it's any other monster. This monster can be unfair because it's up to the party to sort of solve the puzzle of this monster. And so the Medusa or the vampire, right? These are all very specialist monsters that have like all these crazy abilities, you know, that you're never going to be able to just run into and fight because they they have all these crazy powers and abilities. Um, so yeah, um, 
let's let's quickly look at the uh, the ludography ludography uh, for what he uh, James here c- kind of notes as his inspiration. I think we can all agree to this. Luke Crane's Burning Wheel and Mouse Guard for twists, fun once, too many cooks, and much much more. The influence of Burning Wheel and Mouse Guard and Torchbearer, which maybe not, maybe he this character, maybe it hadn't come out by then. I don't know. Uh, very obvious in this game. D&D 4E for the obvious influence, but also for the fact that if not for 4E, I would not be playing RPGs. Vincent Baker's Apocalypse World for teaching me that we don't need target numbers or difficulty classes to make a fun game. XCOM Enemy Unknown for showing me how to make a cover system that makes taking cover simple, important, and dynamic. Rob Heinso and Jonathan Tweet's 13th Age for one unique thing and icons, which influenced my advice on character concepts and factions, which we didn't even cover tonight. And Rob Donahue's blogs for the aspects of skills, originally from Fang Shui, and for the inspiring the six categories of twist in playing without a GM rules, and probably a lot more ideas that were sloshing around in my head. And then there's some information here and there, but by and large, that's it. Anything else? Nope. Go grab a few friends and play. And then we have an index. So roughly in in two hours, I mean, I think, number one, if you're familiar with this channel, you know that Burning Wheel, Torchbearer, Mouse Guard, huge favorites of mine, huge game influences to me. D&D 4th Edition, something we love. Needless to say, Vincent Baker's Apocalypse World and Powered by the Apocalypse is one of my favorite things of all time. Um, XCOM, Enemy Unknown, not a game that I am as familiar with, but I did grow up loving to play Final Fantasy Tactics. But I've never played XCOM Enemy Unknown, and I've seen it in a lot of people's um, recommend, you know, uh, influences. So it's obviously very, very cool and important. We obviously see the 13th Age here. We've done videos on 13th Age. We talk about 13th Age a ton and a lot. And uh, again, and, and, and Rob Donahue, if you're not familiar, is, uh, you know, sort of the one of the people at Evil Hat, sort of the uh, him and Fred Hicks are sort of the driving force behind fate. So fundamentally, we're talking about fate. We're talking about 13th Age. We're talking about 4th Edition, Burning Wheel, and Apocalypse World, which are all games that I love, this channel loves, this community loves. And I just think that that is um, that's quite the list to be inspired by. And I think, I think he pulls it off. Now, this game comes with some caveats, right? We've, we've, so we saw them. It doesn't have laundry lists of abilities. It only has a handful of classes. There's really no monster manual or bestiary. You kind of have to custom make all the monsters, even if it is pretty simple. The powers are not preloaded with fluff. They have relatively silly, although to be clear, you know, very descriptive uh, names of what they do, like get over here or hit that guy. So there could be a reaction to sort of you know, to be negative to it. But I think by and large, um, Strike accomplishes what a lot of these games want to do, but fail to do, which is it's fundamentally a narrative game, but it manages to figure out a way to make, and there's a lot of different ways that you can resolve conflict in a narrative game. You can make a simple skill check. You can make a simple team conflict where you kind of abstract things. But what Strike does, I think, well, is create a compelling tactical miniatures game that is very inspired by 4th edition D&D with very similar concepts and manages to work that and use that same system of narrative outcomes to bring that tactical combat as just another way of resolving a narrative uncertainty. That fight could be a check or it could be an entire gridded miniature tactical combat, but the outcome of either will be the same. It's really just a question of how much detail do you want to go into? And I really like that. And that means that as a, as a GM, you can feel empowered to say, Hey, we're not going to play this fight. Um, You know, uh, make a, make a, make a skill check with advantage or make a skill check and have someone can help you, you know, or, or someone else can help you. We're not even going to do a a team conflict. This is just a minor fight. And if you roll a, you know, one or two, there might be some problems, but if you roll three, four, five or six, you're all, you're fine. And we're good. And we keep going. Maybe there's a twist. Maybe there's a complication. Maybe there's a cost, but we're not going to pull out the miniature grid for this one. It's not that big of a fight. It's just some random things, but I want to include it. It's important, but I don't want to, 
have a full conflict. But then a lot of people, people go, well, I do want to have a full conflict. And then suddenly it's like we're playing an entirely separate game. And whatever happens inside that conflict doesn't feel like it connects back to the narrative elements of the game. We're suddenly talking about hit points and armor classes, whereas before we were talking about harm tracks and position and effect. And it just doesn't work between the two of them. But because the whole point of the fight in Strike is to defeat your foe or your opponent while minimizing or avoiding gaining strikes and that the outcome of the conflict is actually decided by the concession system between how many strikes you have versus how many uh, people you have means that it just becomes another way to uh, uh, resolve a narrative uncertainty, which is great. I think it's really powerful. Um, do, 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 do. I'm just catching up. There's a lot of stuff here. Uh, Doc Flamingo came late. Uh, that is, that's okay. Um, <laughs> spending an action to charge your next attack is so anime and I love it. Of course, you, yes, you need the, you need the psh, streaming lines behind you. Um, uh, KC says lots to like in this system, but some of the stuff it is missing makes it tough for me to prioritize all of, and KC, I think that is totally fair. This game, you know, it's, it's, I don't want to. <laughs> It's not undercooked. It's a little undercooked. I'll say it. I mean, like the ideas presented this, it's, it really reads like more of like a, a really cool toolbox. There's a lot of really interesting and good ideas here, but it is a little undercooked at times. Um, but I think the premise here is so good and so strong. And yeah, there's a lot of games that have come out even in the last couple of years that are very, very compelling. So I, I don't think that I should, everybody should just, you know, go and sell all their Pathfinder two books and, return their dragon bane books and start playing strike. But I think it's important that you read the system. I mean, we have a link to our drive through RPG affiliate in the description. Um, I can't imagine it costs that much money, uh, but it's worth, I think it's worth reading and being kind of like, Oh, that's really cool. It's a really interesting idea. Um, let's see here. Uh, da -da -da. feels like it would make uh, almost make a good one or few shot rule system. It's light, but tactical. The lack of pre monster, pre man monsters would increase prep time. It would, it would. Um, so I do like the combination of PBTA narrative and four E combat, which sounds like, but it see, but it does it. There, there are games that theoretically combine, you know, PBTA or forge in the dark narrative with like a fourth edition style combat, but it does it by like literally having like two separate systems. And I, and I don't, I don't, I don't like that. This feels more integrated to me. Maybe I'm wrong. Remember I said this at the beginning of the stream. Maybe you agree with me after seeing it that you go, dude, Lancer is exactly the same. Okay. Uh, I disagree, but you know, I, I wasn't, I was trying to convince you. Maybe you have been convinced. Um, <laughs> how audacious is it to kickstart a blatantly 4E inspired game in 2014? Extremely audacious. I mean, the only thing I could think of is that there was, you know, God forbid, there were some people who go, I like fourth edition D and D. I don't want to play D and D next. I've seen what they're coming out with. D and D next looks like a return to a D and D second edition mixed with a little bit of third edition. Why would I want to go back and play a game that I've already had, or I've already owned. So my guess is that there was enough of a, uh, of a group of people that were kind of salty that wizard of the coast abandoned fourth. edition. Yes. There we had a dropout. Um, Strike does have a few more supplements, but none look to be a straight best year. Okay, well, I didn't even know that there were more supplements, so that's that's pretty cool. Um, <laughs> I th actually thought we were talking about 4E when I started watching. Nope, Doc Flamingo, we are talking about Strike. Um, yeah, I, I mean, look, the whole point of this was to is to educate, to teach, to learn, and make you more aware of what's going on. Uh, KC says this feels like it connects the two systems better than a game like Lancer, which does feel like a, two completely different systems with not a lot of connective tissue between them. And I, and I agree. Um, all right. Well, that is going to do it for me tonight. Um, I want to thank everybody who stopped in and maybe you're watching on the VOD, but if you're here live and you're chatting with me, you know, uh, we got Kyle, K, you know, KC, Grim, Doc, a ton of was here. Shadram was here. Um, you know, thanks all of you for, uh, you know, uh, point blank was here earlier. Cuddly zombie was there all night commando. 
Um, if you hung out and stuck through this, that's awesome. Um, we are, uh, I don't think there's going to be any streams this weekend. So we'll be back next week. I don't have no idea what we're going to be doing tomorrow. Tomorrow we are going to be doing character creation session one, session zero for our forbidden lands campaign. So pretty excited about that. Pretty good. Um, and, uh, it'll be fun. You know, I, it's always, it's always, uh, it's always nice to start a new campaign, you know? Um, so yeah, again, I, I, I think it's important to point out that it is a flawed gem, as you said, uh, but it has some incredible ideas and there are some things with it that some may really rub people the wrong way, but there's a lot of stuff that really, really work, you know? Um, <laughs> you know, people have been having problems with the super chat function too. So, but never feel like, you need to super chat or tip or anything like that. You know, obviously if you can, and you want to support the channel, uh, do so. I would actually recommend if you were, if you're going to super chat or you're going to tip, um, five bucks or something, you know, and you're not a member of our Patreon, you should just go join our Patreon. Cause it's five bucks. If you want to get in at our, at our lowest tier, and then you get, you know, I still get the five bucks you were going to give me, but then you join our entire crew. You get to talk with all of our people. You get access to our community games. And if you come in at a $10 level or $25 level, you get extra perks above that. So, um, you know, I love it when people support me and I love it when people, uh, uh decide to, to help grow the community and stuff like that. But I think being part of the, the Patreon is, is worth a lot. Uh, I think it's a, it's, I think it's a great little community. So, um, <laughs> we'll probably talk about what it's like to play Forbidden Lands is my guess. I Grim, I do, I, I don't want to just become a, like, remember, I, I never want to be a mono atomic channel. I don't want to be like, oh, and we're talking about Forbidden Lands and it's more about Forbidden Lands. It's more about Forbidden Lands. Um, I want, you know, I, I, I like a lot of different RPG systems. Even as I'm starting up a Forbidden Lands campaign, uh, you know, there are some, there are games that I'm like, man, I wish, I wish uh, I want to play that too. You know, oh, damn that game. I want to play that too. I just read Magpie is releasing a new Avatar uh, book and it's um, about Jasmine Island and it's more about creating legacy campaigns for Avatar, you know, multi-generational play in Avatar. And I'm like, oh, that seems so cool. So, I mean, there's no details for it yet, but I'm I'm into it. That sounds really, really cool. Um, Yeah, so um, Casey, we are gonna, it's gonna be me and Smith and Bob and our buddy George who we talk about a lot. Um, Tim has moved back to our side of the town. So he's going to be joining. And then uh, Kaz, I think he's going to make a character with us, but he hasn't moved back yet, but he's moving back sometime in the next you know, month or so. And so he's going to be, he's going to be in on that. Um, and so, you know, but again, we're, we're one of the reasons we picked forbidden lands is because we really felt like um, if three people show up or if five people show up, I don't have to remake the dungeon. There's no balancing. If a player misses a bunch of sessions, they miss out on experience points. But Forbidden Lands doesn't have levels. It doesn't have escalating hit points. So if you come back and you missed three or four sessions, you know, you're not that much worse off than the characters that were there. Don't get me wrong. Gaining experience matters. But one of the reasons we pick Forbidden Lands is because um, I expect to have a fluctuating crew, including... The fact that I might not be there sometimes, or I might be burned out and I want to be a player. So I might even be making a character uh, because sometimes Bob or Aaron might run an adventure site, like a dungeon or a castle or a village, which I think is really, really cool. Did you end up working out how you were going to generate willpower in your new way of managing it? Anthony, great question. So I spent, so I, I have this thing that I, I do where this is why it's hard for me to design anything because I, and, and, and I'm not, I'm not like sh shitting on anybody who like, I'm, again, I'm not criticizing anybody, but I think some people, let me, let me, to quote Jurassic Park, I think some people are so preoccupied with whether they can do something. They stop to think, they never stop to think if they should. So I think a lot of times people see something and they go, oh, I had this mechanical issue or I have this mechanical problem that I want to solve. And then they create a mechanical system that is really engaging and interesting and it, it works really well. But I think what they, I think a lot of people fail to do, and this is what playtesting does, but this is what I do I think really, really well, is I can take a system that someone else has created or even sometimes me, not that I create much ever, and I can like quickly play through scenarios in my brain and figure out how things start to fall apart in certain circumstances. So long story short, 
there were several issues with, I wanted to use willpower as a resource die, but I run, I ran into several problems that I could not rectify because I was imagining what it would be like at the game table with my players using the resource die and the resource dice kept decaying, which is good, but I know that what my players will want to do, and I want to encourage this is I want to have them have a way to regain willpower. The problem is that in Forbidden Lands, gaining a resource means going up a die size. And since going up a die size actually represents a lot of potential resource, right? If you go from a D8 food to up to a D10 food, a D10 food on average is worth five days of food. That's a lot of food. If you go up from D8 willpower to D10 willpower, it's like I just gave that character five willpower, and that's a lot. And I know that my players are going to want to have little ways, and I, as the GM, are going to want to have little ways to reward them with willpower. So I have reversed my decision. I am not going to award willpower for pushing still, but I am going to, I'm going to use points, but I am going to allow the players and the campaign world to restore a willpower here and a willpower there, even when they're out and adventuring. But the main way that you'll restore your willpower is by going back to a place that is peaceful and serene for you, a place that is safe for you and spending some time and some R and R to sort of recover from the stress of the adventure and the, uh, danger of the unknown and the unfamiliar and the, you know, quite frankly, the uncomfortable of being out in the wilderness. Uh, there's a little caveat to that, Anthony, which I went into on the Patreon uh, today on the discord. Uh, I won't go into it, but I do have another idea, which is called dread. I don't know. What I'm going to call it that, but it's another idea for my tracks. Um, <laughs> Philip wants to know if I can stream that. So Philip, here's the, here's the Philip. Here's the, here's the real truth of it. Number one, uh, for me personally, you know, for, for Aaron and Bob, they're usually on the show once a week on our Tuesday streams, but they're not, you know, sometimes they, they're not even on that stream, but they're on there. They're on the stream about once or, you know, once a week, I'm on the stream about two or three times a week. Sometimes it's nice to have something that is just for us. Secondly, I have people there who aren't necessarily part of the channel. You know, Bob and Aaron, I don't feel so bad telling them that they're going to be on the channel because you know, uh, they get a share of the profits from the channel. Uh, not a ton of money, but it is what, you know, we make what we make. Um, but some of my other players don't. And so I feel, I feel kind of bad, like putting them on the spot and saying like, Hey, you're going to be on our channel now. And they may not be comfortable with that. And I don't want to put them in that situation. So that's, that's why I don't stream it. Um, do, 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 do. Yeah. Well, thank you, Grim. Yes. I would never turn into a single system channel. I, I, I like RPGs too much, obviously, as you can see, I, I agree. It would be cool to see the character creation. Um, you know, I can't, can't wait to see Bob pick a wolfkin. He was talking about that. Um, is this an actual play or a post game discussion? Um, so I'm not sure what you're asking ton. Huh. It's interesting. You know what? I think you're right. I think the can versus should is basically restating is this interesting versus fun or interesting versus good. Yeah. I, I actually kind of agree with that. Um, I think that makes a lot of sense anyways. So that's where we're going to be. I'm excited. Um, like I said, I took, I took, I took the day off so that I can, you know, mentally prepare myself. I'm actually, uh, whatever it's nine 30. I don't care. No one, everyone's leaving this channel anyways. Um, Bob is, is wanting me. He, he's, I like the idea of, I want to create a little player aid and we're going to, I'm going to try to sketch it up in SketchUp and on a 3d sketch up tonight. And then I'm going to try to have him, uh, I'm going to try to have him 3d print it tonight and have it ready for tomorrow. Um, and we'll see if we'll see if it actually, uh, we'll see if it actually works. Um, where are you at? All right. So basically what I want to do is I want to create a little player card. Okay. Maybe like 
four inches by six inches, right? Which is like a, a four by six, right? Index card. It'll be about that size. But remember, Bob's going to 3D print this, right? And so it'll be like, you know, maybe it'll be like, uh, maybe it'll be like, maybe it'll be half an inch thick, right? So it's half an inch thick. And then what I want to do on this is I want to create little, let's say maybe we'll go 0.75 by 0.75. So I want to create little um, divots, if you will, that I will basically use to store the resource dice for food and water and arrows and torches. And I, I'm going to try to see if I can put a little bit of a, a thing on there. So basically, because I want to, instead of them writing it on their character sheet, I just want them to take the actual polyhedral dice and I want them to put the D8 or the D10 or whatever um, and uh, uh, put it into the little cubby. And that way it doesn't get lost with all the other dice on the table as well. But the other thing that I want to do is um, we, I don't know if you'll be able to see these, but at, at, at our game tables, we have like infinite uh, amounts of these, uh, you know, these kind of like glass gaming beads, right? And we use these to track all sorts of stuff. Like Aaron uses these when we play Pathfinder 2 to track his focus points. You know, he'll leave, he'll have two or three of these out in front of him. And as he, you know, goes through a combat encounter, he'll, you know, move them aside and he'll uh, restore them after the fight. So the other idea that I had is I want to create um, a bunch of little, uh, I don't know what to call them, but like, you know, basically little, little divots that in, in the actual, come on. Oh, there we go. Um, in the, in the thing, which will allow me to sort of, uh, All right, it's being a pain in the butt. I don't know what's happening now. All right, whatever. You guys get the point. Point is, there's going to be a 10 slots on the bottom of the tracker for willpower. And that way, instead of tracking on your character sheet and having to erase stuff, you can just use little gems and you'll fill in the little slots as you gain willpower and then you'll take them out as you lose the willpower, right? So that's kind of like that's kind of basically the idea. And you know what? And since we're here, so the idea that I had, because I, I still wanted there to be uh, this idea of like resource uh, sort of de decay. And so as the players gain willpower, right, they are going to fill them up from left to right in these open slots. But as they get worn down by the continual grind of, of, of adventuring, and being out in this dangerous world and maybe seeing horrible things. I'm going to have another glass token, probably like a black one. And I'm, I call it despair because I totally stole this mechanic from uh, shadows over Camelot and, and the uh, Holy grail quest in shadows over Camelot, the board game. And basically I'm going to use these black tokens and they will fill in starting at the bottom, right? And they'll basically fill in these in and getting rid of these will be really tough. Like these are the things that you need to like go back to town and spend weeks recovering from. And what these do is basically reduce the maximum amount of willpower that your character can have. So the idea will be as the characters are out on a long distance expedition and they're camping and they're going on adventure sites, they're going to spend willpower, regain willpower, spend willpower, regain willpower. But the cap of the max willpower that they, you know, when they first start, they're fresh, they can be at 10 of 10, but after maybe a week in the woods or a week in the, you know, the dark mountains, um, you know, their willpower is still fluctuating back and forth, but now the, their, their cap is seven or six or five, right? And eventually it just builds up so much that they can no longer keep a reservoir of willpower. And that's kind of like their sign of, it's probably time for us to go home. It's probably time for us to rest up. It's probably time for us to, to, to spend some number of weeks recovering from, you know, all the adventures anyways. So I want to make this little thing here, print it out as an STL file, 
send it over to Bob, have him print up a, a, a demo copy of it just to see if it, if it's something that, you know, something fun, something we could do. Uh, I've never done anything like this before. So like 3d printing, I don't even own a 3d printer. Bob owns a 3d printer. So yeah, came for the RPGs. Stay for the live CAD session. This is sketch up, but it, it's the same deal. Philip wants to know, how's the table construction going? Are you going to make the toppers slide open? Uh, Philip, um, I was going to go buy the wood for the table the other day, but my wood dealer is on their winter hours and they're closed on the weekends. So I'm planning on going tomorrow. Actually, that's the other reason I took off tomorrow. I'm going to go out and buy the wood. So, uh, table construction pending here in the next you know, week, couple weeks, uh, we'll probably get the frame of the table built, the legs, the aprons, the, the basic mechanics of it. Um, and then the next top, the next part will be putting around the, the frame. Um, but though the topper is going to be, um, so this is basically what, uh, the, the table is going to be. Um, these are, these are what I call player mats. Okay. This is, it, it, it's not actually a player mat. Like you wouldn't actually physically have this on the table. Um, but this is how I kind of like say, how much room does a player need? So this is 14 inches deep. Okay. And it is 30 inches um, across. So each player will have a 30 by four, 30 by 14 area. There's no overlap between anybody's area. So everybody gets a 30 foot by 40 foot area. Now this TV that here that is sort of represented in the middle, we went up to a 50 inch TV instead of a 43 inch TV. It just worked better with the dimensions of the table. And so uh, there's a vault here that the TV will rest in. And of course there will be uh, holes and fans and porting cut in the bottom so that the heat of the table can be expelled. And then a glass sort of a glass or acrylic sheet will be on top of the TV to make it um, to make it see through, right? That's our transparent glass, um, and then you can still see the TV, and it'll ideally sit right on the TV, so that way it's not you don't get this weird parallax shift. Um, each player will have uh, plenty of room, plenty of space, even if you're a bigger person. Um, if you had three smaller people, or if everybody was on a bench. You could probably fit three people on a side. It'd be tight fit, but you could do it in a pinch. And then, like I said, I don't even know. Here we go. There's the topper. So the toppers are, there's going to be four toppers. And then what they do is they simply, and I, I don't have this drawn on the thing here, but um, these end toppers, this, this piece and this piece will have cleats on the bottom of them that will actually lock in right here to the vaulted area so that it sits down perfectly flush and then um basically it'll just sit on top like that and again these seams will be almost invisible uh to the naked eye so this is what the table would look like you know when it's not in gaming mode you know if you looked underneath it you'd be like oh that's a little weird um but then you know boom you take one two three four toppers come off I thought I grabbed all of those. There we go. And then now the, immediately the, the screen is there, you know? How do you take them out once they're covering the screen? Um, well, the thing about the toppers is that they aren't, um, they're not actually, they're just laying on top of the, of the table. So friction helps kill them in place. And this, if you can imagine right here, uh, like if we looked underneath, if we looked underneath this piece right here, right. I would put like a little, this is not correct to scale, but I would put like a little cleat on the bottom of this piece and on the bottom of this piece right here. And that way those ones will just kind of click in and that'll, that'll help hold the table leaves in place. You don't actually need to do this. They'll actually stay in place uh, just on their own. But this way you can kind of make it a little bit more snug and it'll sink, sink up. Um, and then there you go. And, and you have this perfectly thing. So, And then, like I said, too, uh, you can take the topper off. This vault here is deep enough. We're also going to include a, 
you know, like a neoprene mat, right? Like a, uh, like a covering that'll lay on top of that acrylic or that glass. And so then you could put a board game down, you could put a puzzle down and it's deep enough that you should be able to leave most board games up even after you put the lid back on. Now, uh, again, you might not, if you have like really tall pieces in your board game for some reason, maybe that won't work, but any puzzle, any normal board game that has stuff, uh, that'll, that'll fit perfectly fine, with, even with the topper on. So, you know, you could take the topper off and you're in board game mode, right? And then you take this out, you know, this kind of uh, covering sheet, if you will, off, and then boom, you're back to TV mode and you're playing D&D. So um, that's the idea. That's the idea. So what we're actually going to build first is we're basically going to build this first. So this is the, you know, this is the frame of itself of the table that will support all of the different pieces. And then there's a, a, a plywood sheet that goes here in the bottom that makes the vault. So this is what's going to get completed first. And then we'll build the top on top of it. So, all right. Um, well, Philip drive safe, man. Um, I need to get one of these tables. I wonder how much shipping to New Zealand would cost and how much I would need to add to my mortgage. Yeah. I can't even imagine. I mean, it would be crazy. Um, so shipping is, you know, and, and to be honest with you, we we're not a hundred percent sure how we're getting this to California. Um, now uh, it's going to be disassemblable, so it'll, it'll be assemblable, but we have to figure out what's the best option. So there's like, we want it to be, you know, we want it to get there and we want to get there safely and we want to get there in good condition. Uh, but we also want to get, make sure it gets there relatively cheaply so that we can, you know, I'm already going to be spending, remember I'm giving this table away. <laughs> um, I'm already spending thousands of dollars just to build the table. I'm not a professional shop, so I don't really have economies of scale on my side here. Um, you know, a big table production company could probably make this table for, you know, under a thousand dollars, maybe even less, maybe $600, $500. Uh, I am not so lucky. And, um, and I'm not even paying myself an hourly wage. So if I included myself at an hourly wage, the, the cost would be astronomical. It would be, you know, $2,000, $3,000 of labor and uh, materials alone. So anyways, uh, I'm giving that away. But then I'm also, you know, delivering it and in theory in person. So uh, with the nights, which means I got to pay for them because it's a business trip. Anyways, long story short, I'm going to be spending probably like, you know, $8,000 to give a table away. That's okay. Cause that's what this channel, we, that's why we have this channel. It's not to make money. It's to have fun and do ridiculous shit. Anyways, uh, we'll see how it goes. Will I be doing this anytime soon? Probably not. Uh, you know, again, I should say, am I going to be doing this anytime soon again? No, probably not. But you know, it, it, it's fun to do once, you know, it's like the rule from strike or from burning wheel, right? It's fun once, you know, and then move on. All right, everybody. Um, well, thank you so much for joining me and I hope you have a great weekend and I hope you have a lot of fun. And, uh, you know, again, if you're a member of this Patreon or you support this channel, realize that it's your money that allows us to do stupid shit. Like what I just described about building a custom gaming table for someone who lives several thousand miles away from me on the opposite coast of the United States of America. Um, and on that note, everyone have a great night and I'll talk to you next time on nights of last call. Peace. Bye.